Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to look with favor upon this Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Grant that it may perform its high duties as in thy sight. Give divine that guidance to the President of the Republic, and thou members of Parliament and Ministers of State, with discernment and vision, integrity and courage, that through the labors of government, this land and people may be well and truly served, and thy good purposes for the common human life be realized in our midst. Amen. O oh God, grant us a vision of our country, fair as it might be, a country of righteousness, where none shall wrong his neighbor, a country of plenty, where evil and poverty shall be done away with, a country of brotherhood, where all success shall be founded on service, and honor shall be given to the deserving, a country of peace, where government shall rest on the will of the people and the love for the common good. Bless the efforts of those who struggle to make this vision a living reality. Inspire and strengthen our people that they may give time, thought, and sacrifice to speed the day of the coming beauty of Ghana and Africa. Amen. Honorable members, shall we turn to item number four of today's order paper, which is correction of rules and proceedings and official report. We will begin with correction of rules and proceedings. Shall we start with page one? Page two. Page three. Page four. Page number five. Page number six. Page seven. Page Eight, page nine, page number ten, page eleven. Page 12. Page 13. Yes, Honorable Member Fadenta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, page 13, item 14. Um, it says... Um, what page? Member, page 13, item number 14, 14. Um, it says, Master Wisdom, Mauna, the third line, a seven year class one people of Peace Academy in the school is in Ashalbuche, not Adenta. It's in Ashalbuche. Very well. Yeah, and, um, and then the, on that item number, 
the last was one line, a downpour of rain. Uh, I was thinking following a, a downpour will suffice rather than a downpour of rain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Table, please. Take note of that. Let's turn to page 14. Yes, Honorable Member for Denta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, page 14, um, item I, the third line, special import levy and domestic VAT. Domestic has been spelled without an S. Yes. Then yep. item, item number II, um, the third line as well, special import levy and domestic VAT. Domestic has been spelled without an S. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, very well. Table, please take note of that. So let's turn to page number 15. Page 16. Page 17, page 18, yes, Honorable Member for Biom. Thank you very much, very Honorable Speaker. Mr. So, Speaker, this issue has been raised before and there was some direction it's to do it. People attending Wait, page. page 18, attending committee meetings, they are not members of this house, but we don't get their proper designation. And so, for example, you have here, like, Ghana Pentecostal Church Council, without indication who the person is, whether he's a chairman, whether he's the secretary, or what the person is. And considering the bill, that they are looking into, we would love it if they capture properly. Like it's done, if you go to page 19, you have somebody clearly stated the president, Worldwide Miracle uh, Outreach. So if we can have seen for others, so that we know who they really are, it will help. Thank you. Well, uh, I think I, this issue came up yesterday, and it most of the time depends on the people themselves. If they come and give the right designation, obviously uh, the committee or the table will take note of that. So if they just present themselves as this, and if the committee does not also prove to know the specific personalities, the position they hold, obviously they will indicate as we've seen. So probably the committees might take note of this. If any group comes upon you, please let's get the designation of the personalities so that we can capture and capture them well. But for now, I, I don't think the committees or the table what has been uh, ascribed to is, is fault. It's probably that's what they've been given to the committee members. So let's turn to page number 18. That's where you raise the issue. So we move to page number 19. Page 20. Yes. Honorable member for South Dai. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Speaker, for the sake of consistency, if you look at page 21, item number 3. Well, Honourable uh, Member, you haven't got into 21. So. Yes, but what I intend to say is in reference to page 20. Okay. For the sake of consistency, if you look at item number 3, as captured on page 21, the rendition is in attendance. But if you come to page item number 2 on page 20, they simply wrote attendance. And then they put on the Yes. So 
just for the sake of consistency. Yes, uh, my attention has been drawn to it. When you say attendance, we are referring to members of the committee. But in attendance are people who might have been invited or people who for their own inquisitive wants to know what is going on in the committee. So uh, let's get those. So we move to 20, then finally page number 21. Honourable members, the votes and proceedings of the 11th sitting of the third meeting of the first session held yesterday, Thursday, the 11th of November, 2021, as corrected, are adopted as a true record of proceedings. Honourable members, we have official report for Friday, the 16th of July, 2021. And I guess today you have the official reports. Did members visit the pigeon holes? Honourable members, did you visit your pigeon holes? We have this report the 16th day of July, 2021. That was Friday. Please, we've been hammering on this. It is our own report. This is the official report of Parliament. What you said or what you didn't say, this is what the report we have. So it, it is in our own good that we take them, read them, and know what might have transpired over the period. They are lying in your pigeonholes. So we assume that we have, we have them. Yes, Honorable uh, Comfort. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the official reports are not there because Honorable just left there. It's not in the pigeonholes. The 16th July 1 table. How's that? Do you have it? Thank you. Very well. So if the minority deputy whip is saying she cannot locate the official report in her pigeonhole as well as other members, we are we are hold on, holding on to the correction of the 16th July official report. We will do that, but I'm repeating it. Please, a policy that when you come, go to your pigeon hole and clear whatever information you Honourable members, on that note, we move to item number five, which is business statement for the fourth week. Yes. Speaker, I respectfully want to seek your leave 
for us to vary the order of business. And instead of taking item five, which is business statement, we jump on to item six, questions, after which the speaker will, will come back to item five, respectfully. Well, well. Minority leadership? I think it should go by one. Good. So we turn to item number six on today's paper, and that is question time. And we turn to page two. We are bringing back our own uncle to the chamber again. Uncle, you've been brought back to the chamber again to answer questions. Well, well, the Minister for Rules has taken his seat and will therefore invite a member from Panta South, Honorable Godfrey Kinney, to begin with his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Rules and Highways the state of the Brunia Sea to Pusupu through Bontibo to Salifu Road, which was awarded on contract in 2016. Yes, Honorable Minister. But Honorable Members, uh, let me also give this caveat. We have as many as 10 or 11 questions. And therefore, if the question is constituency specific, it is only the questioner who will have the opportunity to do follow-up question. If the question is a general question, I may allow other people to do follow-up question. But if it, if it is constituency specific question, it is only the questioner who will be allowed to do follow-up questions. You, yes, Honorable uh, Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I begin with the back now. Uh, Brevania said to Fusupu to Bontibo Road, measuring 15 kilometers, and Bontibo to Salifu Kurum Road, measuring 6.5 kilometers. Uh, engineered feeder roads located in the Nkwanta South Municipality of the Uti region. Mr. Speaker, currently, a contract for the upgrading of the roads were awarded under the contract name titled Bituminous Surface Dressing of Brewaniasi to Pusupu to Bontibo to Salifu Chrome, measuring a total distance of 21.5 kilometers, and in Suta to Kechi Kwesim, measuring 7.4 kilometers feeder roads. Just because the contract commenced on 16 December 2016 and was expected to be completed by 16 December 2018. The contract is funded under the road fund. The contractors abandoned the site after clearing of vegetation in year 2017 and have since not returned to the site. Warning letters were issued to the contractors instructing them to reactivate the site, but no response was received and the site continues to be abandoned. The Department of Federal Roads has initiated the necessary contractual processes to terminate the contract. 
on impact integration under the 2022 budget. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Yes, Honourable Member, any follow up question? Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to know from the Minister whether there is any unpaid certificate in respect of the project outstanding. Minister, any unpaid certificate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just because there is no outstanding IPS, IPC on this project. I thank you. Well, well. Honorable Minister, are you okay? I, Honorable Member, are you okay? I, I want to, I also want to know whether, uh, I, I want to know the reason for which the contractor abandoned the site. Minister, he wants to know if there's no outstanding, why should the contractor abandon the site? The speaker, the answer unambiguously stated that the contractor mobilized to site did the initial assignment of clearing an abandoned site. That is why he could not raise even any IPC to be paid, because clearing will not allow the, the contractor to raise an IPC. And he abandoned the site, even though he put in a bid and won the contract com uh, competitively. And the contract was awarded, as I indicated, on 16th December 2016. And on this particular project, I can confirm that the procurement procedures as far back as 2016 were properly followed. But it must be understood by everybody that it's not also everybody who comes in for road contract that will be able to execute it. I mean, this is always there and he was one such uh, uh, person. You know, that is why I did indicate last week when I appeared on this floor that we are taking steps to weed off all such weak contractors from our system. And I'm sure very soon there is going to be hue and cry that we do not want to work with certain people. And I am determined to go ahead to weed off all those who are desirous to be contractors but do not have what it takes to be and to perform their job. And you and I are the sufferers because they disturb us in our constituencies. That's why I call on all colleagues that when people start you know, uh, uh, making noise, we should not bring into it, you know, partisan consideration because we know how it affects us. So he was a weak contractor. He didn't have the capacity, even though the procurement processes in 2016, you know, were properly followed. I can attest to that, okay? My colleague minister at the time, you know, or Honorable Inusa Fusseini, you know, did the right thing. You know, he followed the procurement law. This contractor won the contract, but apparently he did not have the necessary capacity to execute the job. And we have such contractors in the system, even today, and I'm determined to weed them out, and I will do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Minister. Today, you know, you have 10 questions that you are answering. So respectfully, be, be, be concise. 
Yes, honorable member, I think you're okay. No, I still have one question. Okay, I give you your last full up question. Okay. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity once again. I want to know from the minister whether his ministry has any plan to rehabilitate the road to make it more durable whilst we wait for the repair. Whilst we wait for the repackaging. Any plans? Minister, do you have any plans to rehabilitate the road? Whilst? I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is normal and it's an ongoing exercise in the ministry. Though, so until we fully work on any road, we put almost all roads in the country under regular maintenance processes. So we shall keep an eye on it to make sure that we carry out maintenance processes on this road until we come back to it fully in 2022. Very well. We move to question number 322. That stands the name of a member for Sige, Honorable Christian, Politi, Otute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to ask the Minister for Roads and Highways why the contractor working on the Wokumangwe to Anyamam Road has left site. Thank you. Yes, respectfully, Mr. Minister. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Ukumagwe to Enyaman Road is a branch road of the Pram Pram Enyaman Road of total length 44 kilometers. The road is a gravel road in poor condition located in the Adan West District of the Greater Accra region. Mr. Speaker, currently there is no major program on the Wokumbe and Yaman Road. There is one main ongoing contract titled, and I quote, upgrading of Pram Pram and Yaman Road, measuring uh, 10 kilometers as phase one. However, the phase one does not include the Okumabe and Yaman Road. The future program for the road, Mr. Speaker, is that engineering studies for the upgrading of this road, that's what Kumabe to Yaman has been completed and packaged as part of the phase two of the Pram Pram and Yaman Road for implementation in 2022. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member Fosege, any follow-up? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I know from the Minister when will the second phase, as clearly stated, that will start 2022? He admitted that the road is in a poor condition, and the people want to know when precisely, whether at the ending of next year or the beginning of next year, so that we will prepare towards it. Thank you. Yes, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows that we are MPs. So as soon as the budget for His Excellency, the President, is presented, and we graciously pass the appropriation bill, everything starts from 1st January. So, even within the first quarter of next year, 2022, this project will come up, and we have to work to ensure that that takes place. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yes, Honourable Member, yeah. I hope you are satisfied. The, well, I will take it so, but I still have a question to ask. Okay, as then to, that's the final supplement. As to According to the speaker, the second phase has been packaged. May I know who is taking that, if it has been awarded, who is the contractor or is yet to be awarded?
Minister, did you get a question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I B Megida is doing the first phase. We are now yet to award the second phase, and you will make sure we award it to a competent contractor. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. This is constituency specific question. So we move to question number three two three. And the no, it's a specific question. I've, or, I've, I've already gone past it. He just jumped. He just, he just came in. Anyway, let him give you the let him give you the slot. Thank you very much, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, that the road in question continues into Ningo from from into the Ningo area. Uh, I know that the minister has indicated that the road will be completed very soon, but there's a phase from the old Ningo Clinic to Mango Chonya, which is part of that stretch. Uh, would the minister assure us that within the shortest possible time, I.B. Megida, who has worked on that stretch, this 4.6 kilometer to complete as well, to alleviate the problem from old Ningo Clinic to Mango Chonya, which is part of the Okumagba stretch. Thank you. Minister, I guess you've already assured him. <laughs> yes, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I agree to the concern of my uh, colleague, and I want to assure him that it will be considered and those projects will work out as one composite project. So please uh, rest assured. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. So let's jump to question number three, two, three. And that question stands in the name of a member for Nalugu Gambaga, Honorable Seidu Isifu. Honorable, the minister is here to answer Thank you, your right question. Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I rise to ask the minister for roads and highways what plans his ministry has to construct the road from Gambaga through Dagurubo Are to Tamboku. Thank you very much. Respect for him, Mr. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Gambaga to Dangui Bwari to Tamboku is a 23.1 kilometer feeder road located in the East Mampuzi district of the Northeast region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, section of this road between kilometer zero to kilometer 1.3 has been an asphaltic surface and is in good condition, while the remaining length is gravel to earth surface and in fair condition. The speaker currently the contract for the upgrading of the earth gravel section of the road to bitumen surfacing is divided into four phases as follows. One, upgrading of Tambaga to Tambogo feeder road at phase one, measuring, and that is from kilometer 1.3 to kilometer 6. Then two, upgrading of Gambaga to Tambogo feeder road at phase two,
from kilometer 6 to kilometer 11, that is 5 kilometers. Then 3, upgrading of Gambaga to Tambogo Fida Road as phase 3 from kilometer 11 to kilometer 16, also 5 kilometers. And 4, upgrading of the same stretch of road but from Gambaga to Tambogo Fida Road as phase 4 from kilometer 16 to kilometer 23.1 kilometers. Mr. Speaker, all the above listed projects are ongoing and physical works achieved include clearing of vegetation and construction of 200 meter of 0 0.6 meter diameter concrete you drain. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Sege, are you still having your microphone on? Very well. So, Honorable Seydou, any follow-up question? Thank you, right, Honorable Speaker. Uh, there's a problem here. The problem is that our hard-working minister, to a large extent, has been misled on this particular question. There's virtually no road there. Virtually no road. Now, my check suggests that actually this contract has been awarded. But the contractors are not on site. That is the real challenge that we have. So may I know from the minister, who are these contractors who the contracts have been given to and they are supposed to be on site and they are not on site? Who are they? And what is the length of this contract that we have given to them, since they are virtually not around to do this job? Thank you. Honorable Sedu, before you, before you, when you say there is no road, what do you mean by that? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I want to say that the road is in a deplorable state. In 2016, Mr. Speaker, well, well, a well, pregnant well, woman well, well, died I'm gotten, on I'm this gotten, road. There is no road I've understood it. Thank you. Mr. Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the concern of my colleague is rather surprising because the information we have indicates that in all the phases and the phase one, all the con contractors have moved to site and working. And we have, uh, as listed contractors, Michelle's Guma and Sons. Phase two, we have Michelle's Accurate and Giant Company Limited. Phase three, we have Michelle's MB Synergy Company Limited. And phase four, we have Guma and Sons Limited. But he is the MP for the area, and I will take his concern and follow up and do a further check on this, because my information clearly indicates that since we have these uh, projects on contract, they are there working. So if the contractors are not there, it's very surprising. Because my technical people do regular checks on this. But I'll just be, I will not also uh, stand here and doubt my honorable colleague. But I want to assure him that I will do further you know, due diligence on this and check you know, to get all the facts about this project. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Yes, honorable, your last. 
follow-up question. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Um, yesterday, I came from my constituency. So I'm on the ground and I'm reporting objectively from the ground. So I appreciate the Minister's uh, response and uh, it is important that we, you know, find a way to reach up to these contractors and understand what's going on so that we can go back to site. Final one. What is the duration of this contract that we have awarded to these people? Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister, the duration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these are relatively shorter uh, distances. Uh, since we have lotted them into four and, and phased them also into four, first phase, second phase, third phase, fourth phase, so they are supposed to take 12 calendar months to complete these projects. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, well. We move to question number 324. That stands the name of a member for Timpani, Honorable Lydia Lamisi. Yes, Honorable. Thank the you, Right Honorable Speaker. Respectfully, I rise to ask the Minister for Rules and Highways. When the work on the Buhuri corner to Basundi project will resume. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, respectfully, Mr. Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the blue corner to Basundi Road measuring the distance of 20 kilometers is an engineered feeder road and is in Tempani district of the Upper East region. Just because the road is partly earth and partly gravel in poor surface condition. Currently, Mr. Speaker, the contract for the spot improvement of the Bugri Corner Basionde Road measuring as I for said 20 kilometers commenced on 24th May 2018 and was expected to be completed on 23rd May 2019. The construction period ended to 23rd May 2021 which has elapsed. Work done to date include 20 kilometers of vegetation clearing 1,490 meters of 600 millimeter diameter U drain, 25 number of 1,900 millimeter pipe covers, 1 number of 2,200 uh, millimeter diameter pipe covers, 1 number of 3,200 uh, millimeter pipe covers, and 2 number of thousand of one uh, nine hundred by seven hundred millimeter diameter pipe covers. The speaker fiscal work is projected at fifty six percent completion. The contractor abandoned site in February twenty twenty one for non payment of work done. Warning letters have been issued for him to resume work. The response of the contractor is being monitored to enable determination of a future contract by the end of November, that is this month, uh, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Lydia. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I want to find out from the Honorable Minister, from his answer, he said that the work is delaying because of non-payment of the certificate that has been raised. Please, what are the steps taken 
to make sure that the contractor is paid so that he can go back to site. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Honorable Speaker or Honorable Minister. Yes, Honorable Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honorable colleague for that question. It's a good one. And I want to assure her that government is taking steps to pay contractors in this country. And as we speak, the first certificate the contractor raised was less than one million. So all those who are owed and who have outstanding debts to one million are being paid across the country. And the Ministry of Finance has taken that step. And payment started last week and is ongoing. The contractor, I uh, understand, has raised another IPC, which is yet to uh, be entered into our database. So I will follow up to make sure that at least one is paid for the contractor to get back to site. So steps are being taken to pay all contractors up to one million hundred percent and then a percentage for all those who are owed above one million. And that exercise is in currency. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Lydia. Sorry, I hope you Honorable are... Right, uh, Honorable uh, right Speaker. Right. Right, Honorable Speaker, sorry for that, uh, Miss. Uh, a slip of tongue. Um, right, Honorable Speaker, thank you for the opportunity again. Um, Honorable Minister, considering the bad nature of the roads, during the, uh, the rainy season of this year alone, we've recorded a number of 15 accidents involving motorbikes. And in your response, you have given warning letters to the contractor, and you are waiting up to November. What about if by November the contractor is not paid? What is the way forward for the road in question? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Yeah, Honorable Minister, I'm just trying to find out whether if by December the contractor is not paid. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure my Honorable colleague that if the contractor does not return to site and then continues to deteriorate, this is why I always call for close collaboration with my colleagues because we constantly do maintenance work on all our roads and it need not be done by the contractor who has been been awarded that contract. We can send out any other contractor to go and carry out the, the remedial uh, works to work on that road. Again, my ministry also has its own MMU, you know, standing by and its uh, mobile maintenance unit. Know, within our uh, highways and I can tell you that if we have any emergency problem anywhere you know as the name suggests there are you know, uh, uh, mobile units that can move to do the work okay like rapid response uh, group so if there is any problem the you know, we can deploy the MMU to go there and salvage the road. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. We move to question number 327. And the question stands the name of a member for Bongo. 
Honorable Adrian Mawa. Yes, my 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 lady has not finished with the follow-up question. What? She has not finished with the follow-up question. She has finished. Yeah, I've given her enough. So, if you had my work, question number three to seven. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Do you have his mandate? mandate? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I rise to seek your permission to ask question star 327 on behalf of the Honorable Member for Bongo. I said this yesterday, I said this last three days, that if a member has a question that has been advertised, and he knows he cannot be here, you should let the speaker know ahead of time. It's not just here, just here, I'm, I'm asking questions for and on behalf of somebody. I've said this. And uh, uh, Honorable Dr. Kementa Park, I said this yesterday, I said this. In fact, this week I've been repeating this particular issue. You may go ahead anyway. Most grateful, Mr. Speaker, for your magnanimity. Mr. Speaker, you will live long. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Roads and Highways when the bridge across the Via Irrigation Dam spillway between Via and Gori will be constructed. Respectfully, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Via Irrigation Dam Spillway, as between Via and Gori, forms part of the main Zari Via Bulungu Fida Road, measuring 9.30 kilometers. This is an interdistrict engineered Fida Road stretching from Zari, that is in the Bogatanga municipality through the Via Dams embankment to Via in the Bongo district of the Upper East Region. The road is partly earth and partly gravel surface and in poor condition. The speaker currently, the construction of the bridge and is a bus culvert. is part of the project titled Spot Improvement of Yologo to Via Fida Road. The project commenced on 10th November 2020 for completion on 9th November 2021. The scope of works includes the construction of two number four, uh, four by four meters and one number three slash three by three meters box covered across the Via Education Dam Spillway with additional pipe covers of various sizes. The contractor is currently on site, Mr. Speaker. Physical works completed to date is estimated to be 18 percent. The works involved include one, one number three, three by three bus covered, and that is fully completed. Two, two number fours at four by four meters was covered yet to commence. One number three is a thousand eight hundred meters diameter PC yet to commence. And then one number two is a thousand eight hundred millimeters diameter PC also yet to commence. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do you have the mandate to ask supplemental question? I presume so, right now, Speaker. Okay, go ahead. Very well. Just one quick one. 
Mr. Speaker, the Minister indicates in his response that work should have been completed on the 9th of November 2021, a few days ago, I think yesterday or so. Clearly, work has not been completed. Can the Minister give us an idea of when work will be completed? Yes, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I indicated in my answer, the construction period should have been 12 calendar months. Obviously, it has delay since the time has elapsed, but quite substantial work has been done and the main bus culvert has been completed. It's left with the pipe culverts, the pieces. So since the uh, contractor has not abandoned site, we will do everything possible that the work comes to completion because this is a very important intervention on the road. So given the time remaining, we hope that within the next five to six months, this project will be completed. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Let's now move to question number 331. Karachi East. Honorable Member Wisdom Kidisu. Yes, Honorable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I write to ask the Minister for Rules and Highways when the feeder rules in the following communities in Krakis municipality will be reconstructed and tied for the easy transposition of goods and services. Adokwanta Dadutu, Adokwanta Katanga Tonu, Matamanu, Petinasi, Bidi Sikeli, Ugede Azizakwe, and Airemu Adiemra Fidaru. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't contact the Doto Fida Road, measuring 7.5 kilometers, is a gravel road in fair surface condition. It is an engineered road which links Adonquanta to the Doto at the banks of the Bota Lake, located in the Krachi East Municipality of the OG region. Mr. Speaker, currently there is no major program on the road. However, Mr. Speaker, engineering studies will be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention to on the road. The implementation of the works will be considered under the 2023 budget. Two, Adonquanta Kantanga Tunnel Road. Mr. Speaker, this road is 5.6 kilometers. It is a gravel road in poor condition and located again in the Krachi East Municipality of the Uchi region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no major program on the road. However, engineering studies will in future be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention to be carried out on the road. The implementation of the works will be considered under the 2023 budget. Matamanu Road, the speaker, this road is identified on the Department of Feeder Road Database as Beposo Matamanu Feeder Road, measuring 11.4 kilometers. It is gravel road in poor condition and located in the Krachi municipality of the Uchi region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no major program on the road, but moving into the future, Mr. Speaker, 
Engineering studies will be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention to be carried out on this road. The implementation of the works will be considered under 2023 budget. The Tinasi Road, Mr. Speaker, this road is identified again on the Department of Federal Road Database as Bettinasi Junction to Bettinasi Feeder Road, measuring a distance of 12 kilometers. It is an engineered road in fair condition and located in the Turkey's municipality of the Rotary region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no major program on the road. But the future program is that, Mr. Speaker, engineering studies will be conducted on this road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention to be carried out on this road. The implementation of the works will, however, be considered under the 2023 budget. Five, BD to Sikari Road. Mr. Speaker, this road is a kilometer and unengineered. It forms part of the BD junction to BD to Sikele Fida Road of total length of 6.45 kilometers. The BD junction to BD measuring 5.45 kilometers section is engineered and in fair condition, while the BD to Sikele section is unengineered in poor condition. It is located in the Karachi East Municipality of the Uchi region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no program on this road. But, Mr. Speaker, engineering studies will be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention to be carried out on this road. The implementation of the works will, however, be considered under the 2023 budget. The Speaker, Project Zizako Road. This road is also identified in the Department of Federal Road Database as Kotokujani to Azikwe Federal Road, measuring a distance of 12.6 kilometers. It is partially engineered road in poor condition and located in the Karachi East Municipality of the region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, contract for the rehabilitation of the Jade Zago Road was awarded under the contract titled Rehabilitation of Otokujani to Azikobe Fidal Road, measuring 12.6 kilometers. Works were expected to commence on 24 February 2021 to be completed by 23 February 2022. However, the contractor failed to commence and was issued with a warning letter. No physical work has been done. A second and final warning letter was issued to the contractor. Honourable members, let's give attention October to the minister, please to commence works by 12 November 2021, February to which the contract will be terminated and repartied. 7. A Yilimu to Adembra Road. Mr. Speaker, this is a 20-kilometer road in a section of the Pari Pari to Adembra Road, measuring 30.2 kilometers. It is an engineered feeder road in fair condition, ending at Adembra. The road is located at the bank of the water lake in the Karachi municipality of the Uti region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, a contract for the upgrading of a four kilometer section of this road, which measured 30 kilometers, was awarded under the contract title upgrading of Pali Pali to Adembra 
52. That is from kilometer 4 to kilometer 8, measuring 4 kilometers. And that funding from the road fund. Works were expected to commence on 23 February 2021 to be completed on 23 February 2022. The contractor failed to commence work and a warning letter was issued to remind the contractor of his contractual obligations that no work has commenced. A second and final warning letter was issued to the contractor on 25th October 2021 to commence work by 12 November 2021, failure of which is a speaker, the contract will be terminated and repartied. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Gidisu, this elaborate answer. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in uh, the Honorable Minister's answer, who is also my brother, he stated that there is no major program on the Adokwanta Dadutu, Adokwanta Katanga Tonu, Matamanu, Betanasi, Bidiskili. Uh, rule, these five rules, no major uh, program. And for the past five years, actually there has not been any rehabilitation on these rules. And they are in total uh, darkness. I want to find out from uh, the Minister what actually accounted for this long uh, neglect of these rules. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also share the concern of my colleague. And road projects are tackled one after the other. At least two stretches of the road projected to Azizapu and Ibrahim to Adyemra were awarded, properly awarded, but the contractors after receiving the award documents, even failed to mobilize to site. And I've also given an indication about the program of the other sessions, which will commence from early next year. So, yes, they have not been tackled during the previous years because I believe my colleague appreciates that all roads cannot be tackled simultaneously, you know, one after the other. My concern is rather that those tackled contractors came in, put in their bid one, but could not be mobilized to, to site. And we are taking steps, Mr. Speaker, to address all these concerns. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Gidis, we are fun now. Yeah, yes, sir. thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in the Minister's uh, answer, uh, he said engineering studies will be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate interventions to be carried out on the road. And he further said the implementation of the rules will be considered under 2023 uh, budget. Uh, I want to find out from the minister. Uh, people living in this community, from till 2023, what temporary measures uh, is the ministry putting in place to ensure that they are actually elevated from these sufferings? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. As indicated, this stretch of road is quite long, if you consider the length. And we will be working on it. We will make sure that it is properly engineered, and we will make sure we have picked all the necessary scope of works on the entire road at various sessions. And picking the inventory 
establishing the scope, putting them together, and doing the estimates takes some time. And as indicated, we are going to do that next year. And once completed, it can only form part of the following year's budget. But meanwhile, until actual work starts on the road, we shall bring the entire road under our ongoing maintenance program to make it more trouble for the people. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, well, Mr. Gidisu, Honorable. Thank it's you, my, my last it, question. It's sir. okay. It's okay, Honorable. I've Wait. given you enough. Uh, we move to question number 333. Mr. Speaker. Question number 333. That stands okay. the member for Wooling C. Wooling C. Honorable Abukari Dawuni. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Rules and Highways whether the following rules in the Wollensee constituency have been awarded on contracts. They include Wollensee Payansi, Wollensee Damanku, Wollensee Chamba, Luni Chandu, and Luni Kunjatandando. Yes, Honorable Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I begin with Wolensi Kayansi. Mr. Speaker, the Wolensi Kayansi to South Sakula Road is a 30.50 kilometer feeder road located in the Wurensi district of the northern region. It is a gravel road in poor condition. And currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no major program on the road. However, Mr. Speaker, engineering design studies will be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention required. The implementation of the works will be considered in the 2023 budget. We will see that man, that man Just bigger. This road links Wulensi in the Wulensi district of the northern region to Damanko in the Nkwanta North district of the Uchi region. It is comprised of two road links. One, Wulensi Opigwa which is a feeder road under the management of the Department of Feeder Roads, and two, Opigwa to Damanko, which is part of the Eastern Corridor Road under the management of Ghana Highways Authority. Just because the Warrensi Opigwa feeder road is a 19.5 kilometer gravel road in fair condition that directly connects Wollensi to the Eastern Corridor Road at Opigwa. Currently, Mr. Speaker, contract for the rehabilitation of the Wollensi Opigwa Feeder Road was awarded under the contract you know, name or titled Rehabilitation of Wollensi to Opigwa Feeder Road 19.5 kilometers. The project commenced on 12 February 2019 and was scheduled for completion by 12 August 2020. The speaker work executed to date includes the following clearing 19.5 kilometers, that's 100 percent, blading. 19.5 kilometers, also 100%, filling 106, 974 
greatest for twenty percent done, sub base eighteen kilometers ninety two percent done, one slash nine hundred millimeter pad covers, eleven number also hundred percent done, one by thousand two hundred millimeters pad covers nine number done two uh, thousand two hundred millimeters pad covers three number also hundred percent done outstanding eyepieces number two is two thousand nine hundred and ninety five two million nine hundred and ninety five thousand one hundred and ninety five Cities 61 pesos. Progress of work is projected at 77% physical completion. The progress of work has been affected by delay in payment for work done. The sub base was 106,974 meters. And 70% is done. Two, Wellensi to Chamba Road. The speaker, this road is a 17.5 kilometer road, inter district road that connects Wellensi in the Wellensi district to Chamba in the Nanumba North district of the Northern region. It is a gravel road in fair condition. Currently, Mr. Speaker, contract for the upgrading of this road, that is Golden City to Chamba Feeder Road, was awarded under the contract title Bitumen Surfacing of Golden City Chamba Feeder Road, measuring 17.5 kilometers. Mr. Speaker, the contract was awarded on April. 11, 2018, and commenced on 3rd August 2018 with an expected completion date of 3rd February 2020. The contractor abandoned site after clearing of vegetation, shaping of road to formation level, filling of low lying and cover session and sub base work. Progress of work is projected at 35.97% of physical completion. Mr. Speaker, the contractor's performance has been affected by payment challenges. For the Lungni to Chando Road, Mr. Speaker, this road, Lungni to Chando to Tapradi Feeder Road is 13.30 km long and located in the Wollensee district of the Northern region. It is a gravel road in poor condition. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no major program on the road. Engineering design studies will, however, be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention required. The implementation of the works will be considered in the 2023 budget. Five, Mr. Speaker, Chando to Konjantidando Road. Mr. Speaker, this feeder road is 9.8 kilometers long and located in the Wollensee district of the northern region. It is a gravel road in poor condition. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there is no major program on the road. However, Mr. Speaker, engineering design studies will be conducted on the road during the first quarter of 2022 to determine the appropriate intervention required. The implementation of the work will be considered in the 2020 budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member, I guess you're okay. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. In respect of the following rules, Lone to Chandu, 
chando tu kujia tundo, dengule si tu pa payansi. The minister indicated in his answer that engineering design works will be carried out on the roofs in the first quarter of 2022. I want to find out from the minister whether the good people of the Ulesi constituency, especially those along the roofs, can be assured that implementation, actual implementation of the rules or of the works will be carried out or considered in the 2023 budget. Thank you. Minister, assurance. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, once is programmed to take place by 2023, it virtually goes you know, with the assurance that it will be carried out. It was already programmed, and it's programmed to take place in that year. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. We move to question number three, three, four. And the question stands the name of a member for China Paga, Honorable Thomas Ada Dalu. Yes, Honorable Member. Um, thank you, Red Honorable Speaker. I rise to ask Minister of Road to ask the Minister for Roads and Highways when the road linking Ketiu to Kayaro in the Kasana and Kana West District of the Upper East Region will be reconstructed. Yes, respect for him, Mr. Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Katio to Kayolo Feeder Road, measuring a distance of 15 kilometers, is an engineered gravel road in fair condition and located in the Kasina Nankana West District of the Upper East Region. Currently, Mr. Speaker, contract for sport improvement of this road was awarded in four phases and a minor sport improvement program in 2020 as follows. One, sport improvement of Katio to Kayolo feeder road phase one, measuring four kilometers. That is from kilometer zero to the four kilometer. Two, sport improvement of Katio to Kayolo Phase two, also for another four kilometers, as from kilometer four to kilometer eight. Then, phase three of the road for another four kilometers from kilometer eight to kilometer twelve, and four to kilometer fifteen. That is for three kilometers. Mr. Speaker, the contracts were awarded on 19 October 2020 for completion by 12, by 2nd September 2021. But all the contracts have failed to commence physical works even after warning letters were issued. The Department of Federal Rules is initiating the necessary action to determine the contracts and subsequently repackage for where are Yes, Honorable. Any follow-up question? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, <laughs> I want to find out from the Minister whether he did not, he did not think that there's something wrong with the four contracts, since all the four contractors have failed to report to site. Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have said time without number 
that this particular issue, and I must admit it, is a major one in my ministry. People put in bids, they win the award, and a lot of them even fail to mobilize to sign. It tells you they came in unprepared, they came in without the necessary capacity, and these are the people that we are trying to deal with now to curtail this kind of uh, problem. So, Mr. Speaker, we are dealing with all the four contractors, and I have their names here. They won the contract, did not perform. So, we have repackaged the project because time has lapsed. You know, the scope might have changed, and we are going to re award. And from now onwards, we are taking all steps to ensure that contractors who are giving jobs are the ones we are satisfied that they have the required capacity. So that will be done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yes, your final question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to find out. I said, Fida Rose is repackaging the various contracts to re award. Uh, how soon? Because <laughs> look at the people that have to organize, there are a lot of calves on that road. So they do a lot of work themselves for, them, for them to be able to pass by. So, how soon do you think Fida Rose is going to repackage the various contracts? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, this is an ongoing process, so as soon as practicable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. We move to question number 335. The question stands in name for member for Jarapa. Honorable Kretus Seydou Dapila. Is he around? He's not around. I guess he has not also assigned anybody to ask the question on his behalf. Yes, Honorable Deputy Rip. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the permission so that Honorable Clement do that on his behalf? You see, I'm repeating it again. Let's address, uh, advert our mind to standing order 68.3. 68.3. And I read, in the absence of the member asking the question, any member so authorized may, with Mr. Speaker's prior permission, ask the question on behalf of the absent member. So that's why I'm insisting. Uh, this week, we've been talking about this. If a member seek to ask a question, and the question is advertised, please let's try and come in and ask, uh, ask the question. If for whatever reason you are not here, and you've asked someone to do that on your behalf, let the person seek the permission of the speaker first. It's not here that uh, someone will just rise and say, I'm, I'm asking the question for the person. Probably uh, after this week, we, we may have to restrict ourselves uh, to the rules. So who is asking the question? Yes, a member for, you have asked uh, somebody's question. Let him, let him ask. Um, is it yes. Mr. Speaker's constituency? Eh? Yes, yes. Very well. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to stand in for the member for Drapa constituency, Honorable Papers. I rise to ask on behalf of the Honorable Member, when the, the Minister, when highways, Minister for Rules and Highways, when the construction of the Drapa Town rules will be completed. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Jirapa is the capital of the Jirapa municipality in the Upper West region. The road network in Jirapa town is in poor condition except the National Road N12, which passes through the town and continues to Hamburg. Currently, Mr. Speaker, the Ghana Highway Authority awarded 3.1 kilometers of Jirapa Town Road for upgrading to bituminous surface in 2016. The project commenced on 11 July 2016 and was completed on 10 January 2018. The contractor executed clearing and left works on the following road. This is resident road measuring 2 kilometers. DCD's resident road and DCD is the district coordinating director measuring 0.6 of a kilometer. Three community training school road measuring two kilometers, uh, 0.2 kilometer. And then urban clinic road, which is a uh, 0.6 kilometer long and car park road also 0.7 kilometer long. Physical work progress is estimated at 17 percent completion. The speaker work has stalled and the contractor is not on site. Several warning letters including notice to terminate the contract have been issued to the contractor. Necessary steps have been taken to determine the contract for non-performance. The Department of Urban Roads has also awarded the unlisted contracts in Jirapa Town. Rehabilitation of selected roads in Jirapa Phase 1, measuring 5.7 kilometers, and B, rehabilitation of selected roads in Jirapa Phase 2, measuring 8.8 .8 kilometers. Rehabilitation of the selected feeder roads measuring 5.7 kilometers. The speaker, the project was awarded on 28 October 2020 for execution and completion in 24 calendar months. The contractor is yet to mobilize to site. And B, rehabilitation of selected roads, that's the phase two, measuring 8.8 .8 kilometers. Just because the project again commenced on May 14, 2019, for completion on May 13, 2021. Progress of work is at 32 percent fiscal completion. The contractor has not been on site since 20, February 2021 due to delay in payment for work done. Efforts have been made to get the contractor back to site to complete all outstanding work. Work done, Mr. Speaker, include 7,400 meters long, 600 millimeter diameter concrete U drain, and one number 1.2 meter diameter concrete pipe. Of I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable, is it Anthony? Any supplementary question? Yes, please. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, in the minister's response, particularly on uh, phase one, rehabilitation of selected roads in Jirapa, phase one, 5.7 kilometers. It was awarded on 28th October 2020, and so now the contractor has not mobilized to site. That's over a year now. Do you have any plans to either terminate the contract or get the contractor to site? Or probably will award it to another contractor? Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. I, I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we have strict rules regarding this, and we have to respect the contractual arrangements. So when it happens this way, we have to you know, uh, follow up the procedure by issuing all the uh, warning letters hoping that the contractor will go back. At times, you may see a bit of a delay there because 
packaging and re-awarding a contract even takes a longer time. So we always try to make sure that we have exhausted all possible avenues before eventually terminating a contract. So it has taken a bit of time. Now uh, we are very firm in our minds and our decision to terminate it and to re-award. And it's going to take place you know, as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. So we move to the final question, 341. And the question stands the name of a member for Asen North, Honorable James Jechikwesen. Honorable the Minister is here to answer your question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, right Honorable Speaker, uh, for giving me this opportunity um, to raise this question that is so dear to my community. I would like to ask the Honorable Minister of, uh, for Roads and Highways when the Wakunda Engineering will be paid for the 20% work done so far on the Asen Breku Town Roads and the Brekutu Nchiso Road in Asen North constituency to enable the contractor to go back to the site. Thank you. Respectfully, Mr. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Asen Breku and the Breku Bireku to Ninchiso Road are located in the Asin North District of the Central Region. The roads, Mr. Speaker, have gravel surface and in poor condition. Currently, Mr. Speaker, the contract for the bitumen surfacing of this road, that is Asin Bireku to Ninchiso Fida Road, Phase 1, measuring 2.8. Five zero kilometers and I seen Biriku town roads of one point eight zero kilometer was awarded on nineteenth December twenty nineteen. Works commenced on seventeenth March twenty twenty with a scheduled completion date of sixteenth March twenty twenty one. It has been a work executed to date include 4.3 kilometers clearing, nine number covered, seven twenty cube cutting, 4.3 kilometers of formation, sub base, base, and primer seal and C. The speaker, the progress of work is projected at 22 percent physical completion. The Progress of measurement and certification for work done begins with the contractor either submitting his invoice for work done to be vetted or requesting for joint measurement together with the supervisor. The contractor working on the above name contract has neither submitted any invoice for vetting nor requested for joint measurement. Therefore, no interim payment certificate has been raised. The employer does not owe the contractor. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member for Asin North, any follow up question? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I just want to bring to the attention of uh, my, my friend, Honorable Minister for Roads and Highways that he stated in his own response, answer, answer section, he stated that 22% uh, uh, of work has been completed so far. If you look back to my question, I, I had raised that 20% completion work, when was it going to be paid? Which demonstrates that I've been doing my homework with the contractors, representatives, the, the engineer. 
This is how I got the figure 20%. And he's able to mention that it's 22%, which we're not too far apart. But again, up here in his own response, if 22% of the work is done, and he's claiming that they don't owe the contractor, I find it, I wonder if that was a work donated by this contractor to the state. And if not, uh, can he respond to me how he can state that 22% of work is completed, but meanwhile, uh, they, con they don't owe the contract? Mr. Minister, do you get a question? You get a question? Very well. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I may share the view of my colleague. It sounds ridiculous and perhaps contradictory that in my answer, I said 22% of the work had been done. But I also indicated that the employer does not owe the contractor. I was talking in a technical sense. Technical sense in that, yes, some work has been done. The onus and the obligation is on the contractor to raise an invoice. And the contractor knows very well what he has to do. Because this is based on what we call ad measurement payment. You raise an invoice and a supervising engineer will go there with you and then based on your invoice raised and based on the joint measurement undertaken by both the contractor and the supervisor. And if they are at them, then the engineer will raise the interim payment certificate. Then it represents a valid document for government to pay. Until that is done, there is no basis for payment and government does not pay, uh, owe you because you haven't established the basis for payment and it's not the duty of, of uh, the employer you know, to raise an IPC if the contractor has not raised a new voice. So that is the explanation of it. So if the contractor abandons his own duty, that thing cannot be visited on the employer. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, well. So, Honorable, I think we are okay. So, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Um, I find it a little bit uh, his response a moment ago that they're pushing the onus on the contractor to raise a certificate of interim work done. I'm very much informed that this contractor, Wakunda, raised a certificate which they have agreed to share a copy with me that this was raised back in October. May actually, my, my. and so when they were not paid, all this time the contractor used his own resources to build the road. So they decided to abandon site because they were short of funds. Just about 1.01 p.m. this afternoon, I reached out to the engineer again. The question I'm raising here is that is the Honorable Minister aware that a certificate has been raised? And if, if so, when are they paying the contractor? Minister. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want my colleague to know that I know what I'm talking about. And I am saying emphatically, and I am sure of what I have said. 
it is not the duty of the, the contractor to raise an IPC. An IPC is an interim payment certificate, and that is only raised by the supervising engineer, the resident engineer. The duty of the contractor is to raise his or her invoice. And after the ad measurement process, when they agree, then the engineer will raise the interim payment certificate. And I am telling you and answering this question, my honorable colleague, on authority that no interim payment certificate has been raised. Because it can only be raised by an engineer from my ministry. And no such certificate has been raised. So I implore the, the contractor that he has done some good work. 22% of work done is quite substantial. I implore him to bring an invoice so that we raise an IPC for him to be paid. But that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Yes. Honorable Minister, Honorable, you've, you've exhausted my, my, your time. My last, I thought Honorable, I you've exhausted your time. I've indulged you. Right, Honorable Speaker. Honorable, time. I've indulged you. In, it's you. enough. Yes, Honorable Minister. No. Uh, I guess we are tied. That's fine. The, 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 the uncle of the you house. Uh, your nephews and nieces. Honorable Minister, your nephews and nieces thank you for coming to the house to answer 10 separate questions. We are grateful to you and you are here by discharge. Honorable members, let's turn our attention to item number five on today's order paper, which is business statement for the ensuing fourth week. Let me invite the acting chairman of the committee, Honorable Avenue Mark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I present the business statement for the fourth week ending Friday, 19th November 2021, to the House. Mr. Speaker, your committee met yesterday and discussed the business for the ensuing week. After deliberations, Mr. Speaker, these were the conclusions. One, Mr. Speaker, it was agreed that 50 questions be taken in the ensuing week, 17 of these agent, and 33 regular questions. And Mr. Speaker, the committee again resolved that First one to order 72 and 72, you may exercise your right to do the following, um, to admit statements from members and ministers accordingly. Then again, Mr. Speaker, bills, papers and reports may be duly presented for first reading in accordance with the relevant rules. And Mr. Speaker, we also agreed that as a result of Mr. Speaker's uh, scheduled uh, breakfast meeting for the 15th of uh, November, the earlier decision to have 
the budget statement and economic policy be shifted to 17th of November. The speaker, it must be stated for the records that under the PFM Act, with the right date for the budget statement should have been on the 15th. And we are making way for Mr. Speaker out of deference to Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've planned post-budget workshop to take place in uh, Abetifi, uh, Rock City. Rock City. Yes, we are going to Abetifi for the post-budget workshop. And the workshop is to be held on the, from the 19th to 21st of uh, November. The speaker, we are giving proud notice to members that the debate will commence on Monday, November 22nd. The speaker, your committee has attached a nine-page schedule of the the program of activities for the ensuing week. Having done this, Mr. Speaker, I moved the House to adopt this report in accordance with Order 162 of our rules and Order 53, Mr. Speaker. I thank you. Well, well, honorable members, the business statement for the ensuing fourth week has been read to us by the acting chairman of the committee. Uh, he moved, and therefore, uh, I don't know whether it's a motion. Leader, is it a motion? Leader. When you said you moved... Yes, Mr. Speaker, it is so. On the 162. Well, well. So I invite members to comment yes. on, the, on the statement. So, Honorable Member for South Dai. Uh, Speaker, I, I thank you for the opportunity. I, I'm happy that uh, within next week, the, the budget statement will be taken. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to bring this matter to the attention of the House uh, because the reading of the budget statement is a, such an important occasion for all the features prominently on our calendar. Our frontage is looking very bad. The main entrance to Parliament House, the, the designs adorning the walls are not looking good at all. They are in tatters. So, if, because we are going to hold such a ceremony next week, I want to draw the attention that they should do something about the designs, especially the Ghana flag and those things around the main frontage. It doesn't look good at all. I thank you. Anyway, these are how keeping matters, but it's good that we are reminded. Yes, Honorable Member for Yapi. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, like the WT majority leader stated, the Public Financial Management Act is clear that the Minister shall, on behalf of the President, lay before Parliament not later than 15th of November. So the law is clear. The Minister is aware that he is supposed to lay before this House the budget statement not later than 15th of November. I've heard the majority leader asking for leave of parliament so that the minister would rather lay the budget on the 17th of November. One would have thought that at least some explanation would have followed and sealed. Is it because 
the Minister of Finance is unable to balance the budget. <laughs> is it because we are going to have a plethora and a colossus of taxes? At least some indication why he wants the date to be moved from the 15th, 16th to 17th. Three clear days. Mr. Speaker, three clear days. Out of time. Three clear days. Out of time. And even in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ rose on the third day. So, on our book. On that book. On that note, Mr. Speaker, at least uh, the majority that should convince the House why we should waive that conditional requirement to the 17th. Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. No, no, you, you come, you come, you come. You come, you come. You come. Let, let me listen to a couple of them. You come. Hold on, hold on. Mr. Speaker, the acting chairman has already. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm doing it on the basis of my capacity. I'm not the leader. He can take more before he responds. Please. I'm in the dispatch box. Please. Just sit down. Mr. Speaker, Honorable uh, please. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Jinapo. Mr. Speaker, when I was presenting the statement, I said that out of difference, out of difference, the business committee has obliged Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker wrote to the finance minister not to come on the 15th, but should rather come on the 17th because he has programmed his first breakfast engagement with the media in Kumasi on the 15th. So, I said so. I said so. It was not at the instance of the finance minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for emphasis, at the risk of being repetitive, it was not the finance minister, Honorable Ken Oforiata, who has asked leave of this house. He has not sought leave he was ready to come on the 15th in, an, in accord with the law. That is why I said the PFM Act gives us a date. So, Honorable Jinapo should refer his query to Mr. Speaker. That if there is any constitutional or any statutory breach, that is what you've just said. Yet it is so. Mr. Speaker, so that is for the record that the change in date is not at the instance of the finance minister. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of the, the environment and the what those are not matters for business committee and when we come here business committee report members are supposed to comment on the report we are not supposed to go outside of the report and if members would pay attention to to the rules these are matters that you can discuss with your leadership or go to the clerk's office and discuss not to take advantage of business statement and to make this comment. Yes, very well. But just to add to what the acting chairman has said, I think, Honorable Jenapo, the announcement was made here. I think Tuesday or Wednesday. 
respect to the change of dates. And we explain that this house is engaged in another equally important assignment. In fact, it has been planned prior to the date. So don't shift it to the finance minister. Uh, it's the house that took the decision. Yes. Any other comment? Yes, let him come to Busa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the business statement that ends today, two questions were advertised or captured in the business statement. They were subsequently advertised in the other papers from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Mr. Speaker, although the sector minister was not in the house to respond to them, I believe for good reason, I noticed that the, at least one has been rescheduled for the ensuing week. However, another question that was also advertised in my name has disappeared, and I fail to understand why. And if I be specific, that question has to do with asking the Minister for Education if all the 766 critical senior high school projects, hitherto uncompleted, have been completed with the disbursement of the first tranche of the $1.5 billion approved by Parliament in 2018. I don't know why it has not been recaptured in the business statement when it was captured in the ending business statement and advertised all week. Well, well. well I, 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 honorable, honorable member, I don't think it has disappeared. It will, fine, it's not here, but you should know that next week is a busy week and we cannot put a lot of questions on next week. So obviously, your question will come. I don't, uh, I don't know, but let me hear you, Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a similar concern. I have observed that on the business paper, the Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection is scheduled to answer a question. However, I asked or filed a question in June, even though it appeared as noticed of admitted questions on Wednesday, 28th July, 2021. Till date, I have not had the opportunity to ask the minister the question. So I want to find out why it is not featured in this business paper. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no Thank you. Is that all the comments? Once I invite the acting chairman, I will assume that we are okay with it. Very well, an acting chairman. Mr. Speaker, uh, my colleague, I don't know, you are first time, right? Yes. So, you see, we have said it here, time without number, that such situations engage your leadership. And the business committee is made up of the leadership on both sides of that. Are you please pay attention to me? And if you engage your leadership. This matter would have been resolved long ago. So I'll plead with you. You don't use this to lament, but use it to solve. So please get in touch with your leadership. Thank you so much, Honorable Member. Mr. Speaker, thank you. 
Honorable Member, are you not satisfied? Yes. Uh, I'm just to let my Honorable Leader know that I'm not lamenting. I'm just drawing your uh, attention. Honorable members, the business statement as presented is hereby adopted. To item number six. Item number seven. Yes. Excuse yes, me. Yes. Statement. And today, at least we have one, two, three, four, five statements. So I'll indulge members to sit in for our own good. Because if we have submitted a statement and it's not read, we all complain. So let's try to address this issue by ourselves. It appears when it gets to statement time, people will just be uh, getting out of the chamber. Please, let's sit in and contribute. So we will begin the statement from the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Honorable Samuel Abujinapo, MP, on the 26th session of the Conference of Parties, that is COP26, of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, held in Glasgow, Scotland, from November 1st to November 12th, 2021. I will invite the minister to the podium and read his statement. What, what did you say? <clears throat> what did you say? <laughs> yes, honorable minister, we are, we are listening to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to make this statement on the very consequential matter which borders on the survival and future of our planet, climate change. Mr. Speaker, as the House is aware, on the 1st of November, the President of the Republic, His Excellency Nana Adudankwa Akufuado, led a delegation from our country to attend the 26th session of the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, held at the Scottish Event Center, Glasgow, in Scotland. Ghana's delegation, amongst others, was made up of officials from the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and the leadership of this August House's Committee on Land and Forestry from both the majority and minority sides. I present to the House highlights of the conference in relation to the lands and forestry sector. Mr. Speaker, permit me at the outset to quote from the inspiring statement of our redoubtable president, delivered on behalf of the nation to the world on 2nd November 2021. And I quote, Mr. Speaker, our world today is battling with a triple crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, the climate crisis, and the crisis of poverty and inequality. Climate change is the greatest threat to the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. It has enormous impact on the fundamentals required for our survival on Earth, and that is why we have converged in Glasgow." End quote. Mr. Speaker, these profound words of the President resonated with the world and the international media. For instance, 
the Voice of America and writers reported the call by the President for developed nations to honor their promise to provide one billion United States dollars for climate action as a call by quote African leaders, end quote. Mr. Speaker, after this staring statement, the President participated in the World's Leadership Summit on quote action on forest and land use, end quote, where he endorsed on behalf of the country the Glasgow Leadership Declaration on Forest and Land Use, which calls on world leaders to quote work collectively to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030, while delivering sustainable development and promoting an inclusive rural transformation, end quote. The President, in his capacity as a member of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, joined members of the panel made up of heads of state and government from 15 countries, which control about 40 percent of the world's coastline, including Australia, Canada, Chile, Fiji, Indonesia, Jamaica, Japan, Kenya, Mexico, Namibia, Norway, Portugal, and the United States, to raise ambition on ocean-based climate action to support the achievement of the Paris Agreement. Mr. Speaker, President Akufuado, who is also the co-chair of the United Nations Secretary General's eminent group of advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, joined the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, the president of the African Development Bank Group, Akiwuni Adesina, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, the director general of the World Trade Organization, Ngozi Nkodjo Iwela, and African heads of state and government at the Africa Adaptation as Relating Summit, held to scale up action towards building the resilience of Africa to climate change through the Africa Adaptation as Relation Program. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and the leadership of the Committee on Lands and Forestry represented our country to articulate and make a strong case for forest and land-based climate action, particularly as they relate to Ghana. On Wednesday, 3rd November, in my capacity as the Minister responsible for Lands and Natural Resources, I signed, on behalf of the Government of Ghana, a letter of intent with the lowering emissions by accelerating forest finance, LEAF coalition, to enter into negotiations for an agreement to provide financing to fight climate change through forest protection and reforestation. LEAF is a voluntary global coalition launched by the governments of the United Kingdom, the United States, and Norway, together with some leading global companies, to bring together companies and governments to provide finance for tropical and subtropical conservation commensurate with the scale of the climate change challenge. The coalition has to date already mobilized one billion United States dollars earmarked to support tropical and subtropical jurisdictions to reduce emissions from deforestation. The signing of the letter of intent marks a major step towards signing a binding emission reduction purchase agreement to assess the funds to support our forest-based climate actions. Ghana is one of only five countries and the only country in Africa whose proposals pass the rigorous screening by the panel of experts. Mr. Speaker, since the first COP in Berlin in 1995, the world has made several commitments and resolutions at successive COPs to reverse the negative consequences of climate change. Regrettably, the world keeps getting warmer, rain patterns are changing, Ice in the Antarctic and glaciers are melting, and sea temperatures are rising. Our own savanna ecological zone is getting drier and more humid, and our primary tropical and subtropical forests are being depleted. Indeed, despite commit, committing at COP21 in Paris in 2015, through the Paris Agreement, to keep global temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius, and pursue efforts to keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius, the World Meteorological Organization reported in 2019 that the years from 2015 to 2019 were the warmest five-year period on record, with carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas concentration increasing exponentially within the same period. This is evidence that we are not doing enough beyond the talks, commitments and resolutions. 
Thus, on Wednesday, 3rd November, at the Ghana Pavilion at the Scottish Event Centre, I delivered a lecture on the topic, quote, beyond the talk, end quote. The Ministry of Lands and Natural, Rec the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources showcased Ghana's forest sector efforts and forcefully called on world leaders to demonstrate real and measurable actions for the 1.5 degrees goal to guarantee a sustainable future for our planet and for the lives of generations unborn. Another important event held at the Ghana Pavilion was the Cocoa and Forest Initiative, held to highlight the importance of the CFI to forest-based climate action and to renew our commitment to the joint framework of action. Mr. Speaker, as the House may be aware, on March 16, 2017, 12 leading cocoa and chocolate producing companies signed the CFI Statement of Intent in London, committing to halt deforestation and forest degradation in the cocoa, cocoa value chain in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, the world's two largest cocoa producing nations. And at COP23 in Bonn, Germany, in 2017, the JFA was signed by the government of Ghana and 36 cocoa and chocolate producing companies to inter alia prohibit and prevent activities in the cocoa sector that cause or contribute to any further deforestation and or forest degradation in national parks and reserves and promote their effective restoration and long-term conservation. Again, Ghana was privileged to deliver the keynote address at a high-level event organized by the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, VCMI, on quote, delivering high integrity, inclusive voluntary carbon markets for 1.5 degrees Celsius, end quote. Mr. Speaker, this event was used to shed light on Ghana's contribution to the voluntary carbon market. We have secured funding for the Ghana Share Landscape Emission Reduction Scheme, which will be launched on 26th November in Tamale by our distinguished Vice President of the Republic, his Excellency Al Haji Dr. Muhammad Dubaumia, to increase shared tree population, restore degraded lands, and reduce emissions by some 6 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in the northern savannah share landscape. Mr. Speaker, on the Nature and Land Use Day at the COP on Saturday, 6 November, Ghana was honored to participate in the Forest, Agriculture, and Commodity Trade Fact Dialogue event under the theme. Quote, unpacking the forest, agriculture, and commodity trade dialogue, end quote, moderated by the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Right Honorable Theresa May, MP. The fact dialogue was launched in February this year by the UK, UK administration as part of its presidency of COP26 to bring together producers and consumers of forest and agricultural goods to protect forests while promoting trade and development. The FAC dialogue therefore seeks to harness the positive aspects of agriculture while managing its negative consequences. Finally, Mr. Speaker, in partnership with ProForest, the Tropical Forest Alliance, and non-governmental organizations of international repute, we held the Marrakesh Plus Five event to track progress on the implementation of the Marrakesh Declaration for the Sustainable Development of Oil Palm in Africa. The declaration signed in COP22 in Marrakesh in 2016 by the governments of the Republic of Ghana, Central African Republic, the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Liberia, the Republic of Congo, and the Republic of Sierra Leone, who control over 70% of Africa's tropical forests and some 13% of the world's tropical forests seeks to promote responsible oil development in Africa. Mr. Speaker, in a statement read on behalf of the government of Ghana by the experienced legislator and my deputy in charge of lands and forestry, Member of Parliament for Achuma Uwabileda North constituency, Honorable Benito Ousubio, we affirmed our commitment to the declaration, which is based on the principles of sustainability, good governance, transparency, community and human rights, collaboration and partnerships, and equitable benefit sharing. We call for an expansion of the declaration to incorporate other tree crops, such as cashew, shed, coconut, mango, and rubber.
as the issues affecting the oil palm industry affect these three crops as well. Indeed, it is for this reason that this August House passed the Tree Crop Development Authority Bill 2019, now attempting to regulate the production, processing, trading, and marketing of all six tree crops in the country. Mr. Speaker, the experts tell us that an, estimate, an estimated 1.6 billion citizens of the world depend on forests to support their livelihoods, including indigenous people and local communities, smallholder farmers, and employees of forest-based enterprises. Yet, in 2020 alone, about 10 million hectares of primary tropical forest was lost. The Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, stipulates that 31% of global land area is forest. Further, scientific research tells us that agriculture, forest, and other land use activities accounted for around 13% of carbon dioxide, 44% of methane, and 81% of nitrous oxide emissions from human activities globally during 2007 to 2016. The destruction of our forests, said to be the lungs of the planet, is a time bomb as we approach the tipping point of climate change. We must therefore act now, and we must do so with courage and tenacity. Fortunately, the government of President Akufuado has begun an aggressive afforest afforestation scheme to restore our lost forest cover and reclaim our degraded lands. Already, we have raised our ambition and have committed to plant at least 20 million trees next year on the Green Ghana Day. The importance of forest and land use to climate action cannot be overemphasized. Forest and land use offers us fast, reliable, and empirical evidence-based actions to mitigate the effects of climate change. We must therefore make a concerted effort to safeguard our forests and lands, and the government of President Akufuado is fully committed to this cause. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, let all citizens of our beloved country, and indeed of the whole world, be reminded of the prophetic words of the celebrated and far-sighted American patriot, Martin Luther King Jr., and be called upon to act with what he referred to as, quote, the fierce agency of now, end quote. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, we are going to limit the contributors because, like I said, we have so many of them. So let me start from... Okay, let, let's start from the senior. So, Honorable Member for Abuyakwa South. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Madam, could you help us? Very well. Honorable yes. member for Braqua South. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to make a very brief contribution to this all important statement ably delivered by Honorable uh, Abujina Paul, the pragmatic minister for lands and natural resources. I call this man pragmatic for the simple reason that. If you are a minister, you can be cocooned in your office, whilst the very practical issues that will help the nation will not be attended to. Immediately, he was ushered in. I would say he even went ahead of the Glasgow uh, meeting and attempted to um, bring our consciousness to the necessity to plant trees. Brother Honorable Speaker, that is a very important step in trying to contain global warming. Insofar as the forest cover of any nation is being depleted, it has an effect on the ozone layer. Immediately, that is challenge. What you find is excessive temperature increase. And when you have excessive temperature increase, 
the consequences are very dire. For example, some of the serious issues of flooding where we have excessive rains is because of the crisis of global warming. And this year in particular, Honorable Speaker, it is only Accra in some serious areas, Canada, United States of America, the flooding levels were very serious. And the consequences were not good at all. It's because if we are not good custodians of our environment, we we'll suffer the consequences thereof. Around of speaker, I want to stress the whole business of our dependence on uh, fossil fuels. That is to say, um, the use of uh, petrol and what it emits. That is why now the whole of the world is moving towards cleaner energy use. And to such a time that we'll be able to contain this situation, uh, the problem will be more of talking than action. And obviously, because I do not know whether we are truly committed to planting uh, 20 million trees in our country. Because, as a matter of fact, to make Ghana green, it is not just the rust matters. It is not just the occasions where uh, MPs will live in this August house and go to their constituencies, but sustainability. We should have a very coordinated effort to get the Forestry Commission to be interested. We plan trees ceremonially, and when we live, the trees will not grow by themselves unless we provide whatever is necessary to ensure that trees will grow and then we have the benefit of greening Ghana. Honorable Speaker, the last thing I will say about the Glasgow um, a, a, a conference, major conference, which is waking us up that what is threatening us could be a third world war. This time around, it's not going to be intercontinental ballistic missiles, but it's just that the elements are angry with us and will suffer the penalty thereof. Madam Speaker, I did not hear about um, uh, the leaders trying to find a budget to tackle this problem. I am of the humble view that if we have such a major crisis, the next important step in trying to solve this problem is to have a good budget, and then money is intended to address the problem are made available. And to such a time that after the ceremony, world leaders will congregate with their finance ministers to come out with a budget, a realistic budget to address this national crisis, will be strong on being verbose rather than tackling the problem. I am very, very elated that uh, the minister has made this statement and it's a huge clarion call to the entire nation that we should make Ghana green. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, for this opportunity. Yes, let me invite Honourable Member for South Dai. But before you start, the time is 2 o'clock and as usual, the business is still with us. So I will indulge you to allow me to extend sitting beyond two o'clock. And again, before you talk, please indulge me again to suspend sitting for five minutes.
Well, well, Honourable Member for South Dai. Uh, Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to make some few comments on the statement made by the Minister for Natural Resources, Land and Natural Resources, on the very topical matter of climate change. Mr. Speaker, to the extent that uh, investors are now running higher academic programs in this matter lends credence to how important and how topical it has, it has become. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy that the statement is in reference to the recently held uh, Glasgow conference in, in Europe on the matter. Mr. Speaker, as a country we are presently expending very scarce resources on undertaking sea defense projects in places like Discov, Axim, Takradi, Komenda, Prom Prom, Adan, Anyami and Jita area, Keta and Blekusu. Indeed, we, we've expended scarce resources on undertaking sea defense projects between Tema and Accra coastline. Mr. Speaker, just last year, the House approved about $69 million for the Prom Prom Sea Defense Project, which is presently ongoing. The pounding of our coastline between Aflau and Hafastin, stretching for about 600 kilometers in various places, as I've mentioned, that are receiving attention from government, is attributable to climate change. What are some of the incidences? It's been determined that the sea level has risen and continued to rise. And within the past hundred years, it's risen for over, over a meter. What it means is that when there's a rise in the tide, at the dawn, normally that's when it happens. And and the waves and the sea is disturbed. These huge waves will pound the coastline. And because there, there is a rise in the tide, they normally won't pound the shoreline anymore because they are high. So with reference to the Keta Aflau tidal waves in 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 in, 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 in focus. You see the sea flowing as if it's a river in flood, practically overflowing the low-lying areas. Mr. Speaker, so the issue of climate change is also reflected in the fact that we are experiencing desertification. What this means is that our high savannah areas are experiencing high temperature rises leading to withering vegetation resulting in high bushfires and this destroys the vegetation necessary for food production. Mr. Speaker, it also has an adverse effect on the, the pattern rainfall and, and weather system that we know. So in November, normally it would have been the Hamatan, for instance, in this country. But in November, Mr. Speaker, we are experiencing torrential rainfall. So climate change again has resulted in erratic rainfall pattern. Our farmers are unable to plant and farm to produce our food crops. It is therefore no wonder that even though 
we are making strides in in trying to bring improvements in our farming systems and, and, and increase food production. We are experiencing high food prices because the timing for farming for for timing of farming for farmers has become erratic. Mr. Speaker, may I conclude by saying that as we speak, over 4,000 persons have been adversely affected by the sexy flooding that has occurred between Anyangui and Aflao. Mr. Speaker, this is an incidence of climate change. And the question is, as a country, what is the long-term solution to this problem? Because the population between Aflawa and Anyangui to Adan is nearly a million. Are we going to think of land reclamation? It is costly. But once we are thinking of building a harbor in the area that we first face alone will cost us in excess of 600 million dollars it means that we must be prepared to ensure that the people first of all have life before they can operate from the harbor so mr speaker i want to urge the government that we are back it is it is on record that we, we went to glasgow with 337 participants. I am not saying it. That's the record from the conference organizers. These are persons selected from all of the relevant agencies and ministries in this country. I am hoping that I am hoping that we can fashion a certain policy. Honourable, before you conclude, I think uh, the honourable minister. No, he wouldn't get any chance to wrap up. So let, let, let us be factual. So, Honorable Minister, if you have any, any issue with regards to the figures, because it's been bangled everywhere. Mr. Speaker, first of all, it is not correct that the government of Ghana sent a delegation of 300 people to Glasgow. That is not correct. He's not saying government of Ghana. Says, Mr. Speaker, anyway. the government did not send a delegation of 300 people to Glasgow. The country, I'll tell you how many we did, but before I do, the country did not send a delegation of 300 people, 300 people, 300 people to Glasgow. Mr. Speaker, always three categories of people have been so for years not only under MPP. The, the president and his delegation, government delegation, and the country's delegation. There are civil society organizations, and there are NGOs who attend this conference, who attend this conference. But the protocol, the protocol of the, of the organizers is that to attend the conference be, have a country accreditation. And all the people who attend will have a country accreditation. You have uh, 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 NGOs in uh, the forest sector, in the ocean sector, who go on their own volition. What should be, should be clear, the government did not send 300 people to Glasgow. 24 members of government delegation went. 24 members of government delegation went for the Glasgow, including members of the minority side. The ranking well, well. member for lands and forestry and his, and his deputy were members of my delegation in Glasgow. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that we don't get into unnecessary argumentation. Let us set the record straight. My good friend, 300 people were not sent to Glasgow. That is not correct. Very well. Honorable, just conclude. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's very important. What I chose my words carefully, I said the country was represented. I didn't say government sponsored. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. The, no, I said the country was represented by 337. And I said, I am not saying it. 
the organizers of the conference. So if you are clarifying that, that by that there are there are some that were sponsored by the state, some who went there but must reflect the country of origin. That is all good. But the point I want to make is that I am hoping that these participants who were selected from various sectors that have some relevant whose activities have have some relevance to bear on on matters informing the issue of climate change would fashion a certain national policy by way of response to tackling the 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 menace of climate change in this country mr speaker with this voice i thank you for the opportunity yeah. Very well. yes honorable member for takura day for the three please is it takura day because mean thing efia 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 Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the statement on the floor, ably made by my friend, Honorable Minister Samuel Tinapo. Um, his hard work has really made all of us proud of him. And the very statement he's made on the climate change issue, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to highlight certain key issues that as a country, we should, as a country and a, as a house, we should avert our minds to. And Mr. Speaker, there is a casual observation any Ghanaian can make uh, today when we look at climate trends. You don't need figures, you don't need science, you don't need any statistics to even um, associate yourself with the changes we physically see and experience every day. The Kita experience is trending and we've seen that this is part of the climate change issues. Mr. Speaker, rainfall patterns, we today experience heavy rainfall at times that we really are not expecting even the rain to fall to that extent and the extent the sun even generates heat are all physical evidences the casual observer on the streets can associate with and see that there is indeed a climate change when we compare with when we're all infancies and um, we're experiencing these things today but from the Glasgow uh, visitation, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me say that Ghana is making all these trainers efforts to contribute our quota to reducing the carbon dioxide emissions or the greenhouse, green, greenhouse gas effect. We're doing everything we can. Afforestation programs have been implemented. A great effort, green, that is greening effort, we're making them to contribute positively to the reduction effort. But I want to draw attention to the fact that as part of our economic development strategy, we are also embarking on industrialization. And countries that have industrialized, did that on the back of generating greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases. And for that reason, I can say, since we keep our efforts at industrializing, that is generating one district, one factory, uh, doing intent for integrated iron and steel industry, planning for integrated aluminum industry, petroleum hub, we are actually embarking on increasing our greenhouse generation levels. So, the Minister for Land and Natural Resources, his efforts at making sure that on the other side, or that is on the other side of the carbon accounting, that all the efforts the Ministry is making to ensure that we positively impact the environment is just to offset this effort we are making at industrialization. 
And so as a house, we should all support and applaud the effort the minister is making so that when we start, when the industrialization takes off, we do not find ourselves wanting, having to buy carbon credit from the international market, which is expensive, Mr. Speaker. On the number of people that visited the Glasgow um, conference... Mr. Are you Speaker, going there? Are you going there, Honorable? On, I don't think it's an issue. I mean... Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, well, um, you, if, I am making, I'm making a point that it's everywhere, it's a job creation opportunity, it's an investment opportunity because there's so much funds, so, 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 so much funds, which has become available in the global financial space for climate change activities. And so I was happy seeing Ghanaians generating interest in this area so that um, we can tap into the funds available and generate jobs. So it's a positive development, Mr. Speaker. Um, with those few remarks, I really, with a statement, the, finance, uh, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources made. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Thank you. I think you are, you are, you are, you are, you are remarks on the numbers I share with you. Uh, other groups went there to also uh, seek for investment. So I think it's, it's a good answer. Let me come to Honorable Apak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to comment on the statement made by the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the Minister is right in many respects. But I think it is instructive and important that we look at our own regimes of protecting our environment and to assess as to whether the measures in place are effective enough. Mr. Speaker, as for the signs of climate change, we can all list many. The point is, how do we address the present danger? It's within this context that I want to point out to the Minister that whilst we've, we've made some substantial progress on a number of levels, especially in the area of the fight against the illegal harvesting and export of rosewood, there is an emerging, emerging trend which is the exportation of charcoal. And charcoal, of course, is a byproduct of wood. Charcoal has become a very sought-after item. It has now become an item that is used as the base material for quite a number of pharmaceuticals, including even toothpaste. So when you see all those trucks between Tamale and Accra carrying those huge quantities of charcoal, those quantities are not coming to us in the urban areas for use. They are exported. So I want to use this opportunity to draw the minister's attention to this phenomena so that we see how we can address it. Because the increased cutting and burning of wood for charcoal to serve the pharmaceutical industry clearly has implications for us in the attempt to protect our forests. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now coming to the uh, leadership. Who? Yeah, okay. Honorable Newman, that one. Then it means I'll come back here. I hope leadership wouldn't mind if you sacrifice. Yeah. Very well. Honorable Dakwa, let me hear you. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving me the chance to contribute to the statement by the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Honorable Samuel Jinapo. Mr. Speaker, we're all aware of the adverse effects of climate change. All of us in this chamber are aware of the havoc climate change is wreaking throughout the world. This is manifested in rising temperature, which we all experience, rising sea levels, which um, our brother spoke of, he spoke of Keta experiencing these rising sea levels, 
Um, we also experience high incidences of extreme weather. Mr. Speaker, we are in November, but we are all experiencing a lot of heavy rainfalls, which is unusual. Mr. Speaker, aside from all we've spoken of, we know the adverse effect it has on crop production, as well as our food security in Ghana. Mr. Speaker, aside all this, I'd like to focus on adaptation. All these problems I've spoken of concerning food security and crop production, we all have to come together and see how these problems will be resolved. Mr. Speaker, we know we have to adapt to these changes that are being caused by climate change. And what I'd like to state for countries like Ghana is how to adapt. The issue about how to adapt boils down also to funding. Mr. Speaker, the Paris Agreement passed in 2015 in Paris promised $100 billion in support of climate action. Yet as it stands now, this promise hasn't been met yet, Mr. Speaker. And this is very disturbing to us, as developing countries, because we also depend on some of these supports that is given by these countries to help us adapt and fight climate change. Mr. Speaker, we need to find measures to help people to adapt. But whilst we are doing this, Mr. Speaker, we have to look at the role we all play. The role we play as Ghanaians in felling trees for firewood, Mr. Speaker. If we can all play our role, we won't only rely on the support that is given to us to fight, but we will fight it here in Ghana in our own way. Mr. Speaker, as the minister was reading his statement, he talked about a summit that has been organized by the Africa Development Bank, which is dubbed Africa Adaptation Accelerating Summit, which is to build up the resilience of Africa to climate change. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to appeal to all of us that the Green Ghana Day is not just a day set aside to plan trees, but we would like to appeal that we all embark on this green throughout the year. We don't wait for the Green Ghana Day to celebrate it, but we all continue to water these plants, to nurture these trees, so that in future, Mr. Speaker, generations to come will come and experience a greener world than we are experiencing now. Mr. Speaker, I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Yes, Honorable Member for BIM, and I guess that will be the last Pardon, don't worry. Let me give another member for BIM. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to add my voice to this very important statement made by the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, matters to do with environment are matters that affect everybody. And therefore, you can see the interest the House is showing despite city for a very long time. The forest cover is dwindling, it's reducing in a very fast rate. Rivers and streams we used to know where we used to fetch water. Sometimes people try their swimming skills and the rest have today all dried up. They have now become parks where you can play football. And so the impact of the environmental changes is being felt everywhere. Streams that used to provide fish for local community are no longer there. And so we are faced with some reality that we need to work towards reducing the impact that these environmental changes is having on us. But the responsibility must not be left only for the Ministry of Lands and Natures. Indeed, it must be an interministerial and interagency actions. Sometimes, when you drive in even towards the central region, around Weja uh, uh, Dam area, you look to your left and you see the destruction that has been done to the topography of the land just because people want to build all kinds of fanciful structures without realizing that when you do that, you are causing a lot of damage to the environment and which may even end up affecting your own building. Again, Mr. Speaker, if you are driving to a bridge, 
we are beginning to see the same thing happens on the mountain. Is it not possible that in some areas, as a country, we will have policies where you are not allowed to disturb the topography of the land when you want to build your structure, and that build to the existing topography? If you don't have the capacity to do so, don't go there. People attempt to level hilly areas before they put up buildings, and by so doing, what we experience with the slightest rainfall is landslides, and we must be working to reduce this. Mr. Speaker, I also agree with Honorable Atacha when he talked about the Green Ghana project. I would love to see that the next one we are going to have will not just be about encouraging MPs and other senior persons to plant trees, but the minister together with other agencies will demarcate a particular zone that we want to plant this number of trees in this zone and take time to nurture them so that in five years, in ten years' time, an area that used to be maybe semi-arid will become a forest. Then we will be marking ourselves. Once we do the other major one, where we encourage people to plant trees around as part of what a hobby. Mr. Speaker, uh, has been talked about also, and the issue of cocoa. Cocoa truly, by its cultivation, itself aids afforestation. What, what, is affecting, what is affecting the cocoa production is sometimes the failure to pay farmers wages or, or prices that are good enough. And so you are having many of them having to now sell off their lands for all kinds of anti-environmental activities such as galamsey and so on and so forth. And so if we truly want to do some level of afforestation, we must also begin to look at the pricing, what we give to farmers who go into three crops so they can sustain their activities that will help even the environment. The other day, the member for the team North made a statement in relation to cashew plant and then the cashew board. These are things that we should be looking at. Mr. Speaker, I know time is against us, so I do not want to go further. With these few ways, I want to thank you and thank the maker of the statement for drawing our attention to this all-important subject. Thank you. Leadership. Uh, I think uh, sac let's sacrifice your time. Uh, Speaker. Oh, you still want to? Speaker, if you may indulge me, we want to, with your, with your leave, very... No, no, but we have to finish this particular statement. Finish yeah. this. Yeah, so, we want to plead with you. I am a, I'm an environmentalist, a climate expert. I cannot forego this. I have to speak to it. Well, well. So yeah. let me come to leadership. Let me start with uh, Honorable Abuja. Right, Honorable Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. And I thank our colleague, the, the Minister, for the statement. Mr. Speaker, uh, please be colleague, snappy for us. Yes. Other colleagues have raised uh, issues as to how we see cloud. Mr. Speaker, there are some misconceptions. The tides on the seas are not necessarily caused by climate change. We know <coughs> the relationship between the moon and the earth that causes the way the tides behave. Indeed, when the ice melts, it will obviously pour more, more water into the seas, so that can help. But, but it's not the case that once you see a tide, it is climate change because... But, but when the ice melts, is it not climate? No. They are all part of climatology. That, that, the ice has been melting all the time. I'm saying that what you see as tidal waves but on our coastline throughout the world... What I'm saying, they are all part of climatology. It's part is, of the climate. The major part is the relationship between the, the moon and the earth. That is scientific. It's not... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's it's wrong. Wrong. But the most important thing is this. My colleague made the, the statement. The burning of fossil fuel has got a direct relationship to the development of every country. The reason China is what they are today, what we call the, the, the manufacturing hub of the world, is simply because the heavy industries need to burn fossil fuel to turn things around to, uh, as manufactured products. So, and if you take a look at the table, Africa doesn't even feature really in terms of uh, the, the emission in terms of carbon, uh, 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 carbon emission. So exactly, what are we talking about here? So as a Ghanaian, are you, is anybody going to tell me that if we need to burn more fossil fuel to create industries and create jobs, we should sacrifice that? No, we shouldn't do that. 
when the, the West did that, and today that is why they are developed. So let's do it. That is why parity is necessary. All these billions that we went cap in hand begging for, Mr. Speaker, they aren't going to give you any billion dollars to bring to Ghana to do anything. But I believe as a country, we should do things that will help us. I see climate change. If the, the weather is getting hotter, Mr. Speaker, it behoves on product manufacturers to develop more materials, like build, put up buildings that are more insulated. It's also an opportunity. If the seasons are changing, maybe people who, who develop seeds or plants should be able to tell us that maybe we can develop plant, uh, plants that can withstand drought or can get... Mr. Speaker, today, there's a species of rice that doesn't need all the water that we, we need. We don't need a, a, a swamp area to de develop some rice. Mr. Speaker, I want to add government. Is tree planting the only way we can, we can talk about uh, uh, addressing climate change in Ghana? So when I hear the minister talking about we need to plant 20 million trees and other things, for me, it's just scratching the, the surface. That is not the, the real solution. We need to see government policy. In terms of even transportation, what is government solution in terms of reducing emission when it comes to transportation? Somebody already said it. In a few years' time, some countries will not even allow you to drive a vehicle powered by fossil fuel. What is government's role in this? Construction. What is the, 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 the decision of government in terms of how we put up our roads, our buildings and other things? Those are the things we should be talking about. Agriculture. Some people are beginning to think that even if you grow more cattle in your country, the, graze, the grazing land that they use actually emits so much uh, uh, CO2. What is our solution to uh, uh, this? Thing? So, Mr. Speaker, instead of every day, every year telling us that we should plant more trees, which is good, that cannot be a country's response to climate change. It has to be more than that. And I'm saying that in terms of agriculture, in terms of uh, transportation, other things, those are major em em emitting uh, uh, ways that we can, we can deal with this. And for me, I will come back from Glasgow. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about the numbers because, Mr. Speaker, when I go through the list, that we are told the president, the president's, uh, what do you call it, security uh, men, the president's physicians and other things were part of it. So we will not do that argument as to whether everybody in the name of government, EPA, everybody, amounted to the 20, uh, 20, 24 the, pre, the minister is talking about. But obviously, this is not the first time. Colleagues from this house are part of it. But the truth is that, Mr. Speaker, when things are tight in this country, maybe even the 24 could be less. That is why maybe only the ranking here and the, the chairman there could go. Ghanaians are saying that we should tighten our belt. So if 24 used to go, maybe the next year, it should be 15, Mr. Speaker, because things are really tight in this country. Mr. Speaker, these are the few the comments I have. That climate change in this country, I haven't seen anything government is doing so far to address it. Planting trees is too little a decision for government to make uh, in terms of how we can address this. And I want the, the, the minister to come back in the future with a more concrete ways we can reduce emissions in this country. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, Honorable Speaker. Uh, first of all, it's important for all of us to recognize that, yes, the planting of trees is not only the only approach in reducing climate change or having an impactful effect on climate change. But the expert tells you that if, if, if the means of crisis is important, you deal with the low lie uh, hanging fruits. And I tell you, one of the low lying fruits is a plantation of trees. I'm telling you, if governments that have come and gone had planted I mean, incrementally, increase our forest cover. We will not be telling the story today. And I am being very straightforward and objective. If we had done incremental increase in the plantation of our forest cover, we would not be telling the story today. I mean, you cannot take anything away from the young, brilliant, energetic, who for the fleeting period has been in office, he's shown dramatic efforts. I mean, to the extent that now we have religious bodies, uh, pastors, chief imams, and other focal persons in this country joining in the fray in tree planting. It's a worthy exercise, and we must all commend it. It's important. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we've not been planting 
in that if we have engaged in an incremental increase, we would have gone way, way ahead. Now, I agree with you when you talk about other functionalities that need to be effective. Speaker, yes, there are cross-border issues. There are cross-border issues. The Ministry of Lands and Forestry comes in. Unfortunately, they are seen to be playing the frontal role. The Minister for Roads and Highways, they come in. Recent times, when roads are constructed, within a short time, they come wearing away. Why? Because maybe even the materials we use in the construction of the roads, they are not adaptable to the current extremities of weather patterns that we are having as a country. So I agree with you. Cross-border issues. Speaker, one thing I have observed, which I think we all need to recognize, is that we need to domestify what we call climate change. I mean, there are a lot of people, highly educated, who don't even believe in that. And the people in the countryside, our farmers, our fishermen, we need to domestify this. So the concept and the functionality of PR is so important that we revert our minds to it and make sure that we are able to demystify what is it that climate change is all about. Is it just natural changes in the weather pattern? Experts have said that 90% of the causal effect of climate change is anthropogenic factors, human factors. Because we are, it is defined and we know the causal agents, then we can have much more effect in the control. So we humans cause or facilitate about 90% of the outturn of climate change. So we have to advise ourselves. I think our president globally has demonstrated, I was touched when the president, uh, president looked into the faces of world leaders and said that you have promised us some huge sums of money and this money is still outstanding. A certain hundred of uh, billion, billions of dollars. Because, as the Honorable Abuja rightly intimated, Africa just emits about 4%. 4%. The Western world emits close to 80%. So really, but unfortunately, we are, we are most vulnerable. So at the bottom line, you see Africa lying out there, and that is where the difficulty is. So that from the, from the First World War, Second World War, we've had serious apocalyptic moments in the world. The Spanish flu, uh, financial crunch, 9-11. Today, experts have said that two very important items on the global agenda, climate change, poverty reduction, that's what it is. But I, I heard my colleague, the Honorable Abuja, when he argues about the insignificance of the emission in Africa. Hence, there's a principle of the polluter pays. The polluter pays principle. And then we have the carbon trade concept. Probably this is where we may have to also build our capacity as a country to be able to break in the billions of dollars that other countries who have the capacity and the upper hand. That is the focus on. I think our colleague has done well. On the tree planting, you can fault him. I mean, we've had Auditor General's report, and so we are, I don't want to go into this area. So we had Auditor General's report of previous governments, and here, I said previous governments. I'm not being specific to any government, unless you have something to hide. Previous governments, wasting the state resources on tree planting, planting trees in the dry season and causing a lot of financial loss to the state. So we, we have to come to a certain consensus and agreement in terms of the fact that the Honorable Minister is doing something right and all of us must support him. And we as members of parliament also have a role to play because in terms of industrialization, we are not emitting. So what can you do to have that microclimate which will have a very healthy uh, environment, which will have an impact on the environment. And it has to do with tree planting. Speaker, I want to commend the President of the U.S. of A, President Biden, who 
You know when the, uh, we have the, the Paris Agreement, the U.S. of A put out under President Trump. And the effect of it was there on the world and the globe. Now, President Biden has made commitment. China has made commitment. We are hoping that Russia will also make the same commitment. But bottom line is that Ghana has indeed we have a policy. There is a climate change policy in Ghana. There is. Honorable Bojan may have to check. We have also redefined our NDCs, the nationally determined contribution. Under this government, it has been reviewed. It's been accepted by the globe. The, 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 the international community has accepted that of Ghana. No, it has to be incremental. During your time, if you have done it, we will have continued. Listen. So, speaker, in conclusion, and I, I recognize that we have limited time. We must give praise where praise is due. And this kind of shifting goalposts and trying to find fault where there is no fault. No, we must encourage the minister we, to do the right things he's doing. And the tree planting is important. Don't undermine it. So, got, so climate change, the Paris Agreement, we are, we are, we are, we are happy uh, US of A is on board, China is on board. What Africa should do, which speaker will be my concluding words. What he said, I agree with him. There's what we call um, differentiated responsibility. Speaker, I'm concluding. Differentiated responsibility. And by elucidation, what I meant is that pollution in one part of the world is pollution in the entire globe. So the Western world cannot force clean energy concept on us. They polluted the world to be where they are and to, to industrialize. So probably we also need to be very strategic in our adoption of clean energy whilst we develop our industrial sector. It is critical. Otherwise, we'll be adopting clean energy at the expense of industrialization and the expansion of our economy. Um, and we'll be increasing our poverty. But fact be told, I want to commend His Excellency the President. It, it was a joy. Uh, it, it was joy complete joy to hear the president, to witness the president, not just talking, everything stuff from speech. The president looking into the faces of Biden and all of the uh, leaders and telling them that you promise to pay billions of dollars, you have to fulfill it. That is confidence. That is confidence. And you cannot help it, but you have to praise the president. So, the, the president good effort, complemented by the able and intelligent uh, minister. We drove our camp. And I can assure you that this house is rallying both sides of the house. No partisan position. We are rallying behind you. Anything you will do to ensure that Ghana come atop the crisis and the advocacy for climate change, we give you all the support. Speaker, so thank you. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. Yes. Uh... We we'll go to the second statement. Yes, Honorable. Yeah, with your kind indulgence, if you may, and with the blessing of my colleague, we'll write the order of business and we'll take item, page four, item eight and nine. As we guys seek your leave for the hard working and intelligent Minister for Lands and Forests to do the laying uh, on behalf of the Minister for, for, for Roads and Highways. Item number what? Item 8 on page 4. It's just late. <laughs> well, well. So, we... Yes, available. Mr. Speaker. Uh, under normal circumstances, this is not an issue. But this is a very big loan to be taken by the Ministry of Road and Transport, uh, Road and Highways. The minister has got a deputy. So it would have been good if the, my colleague explained to us why the minister or his deputy are not here. So if that application can be made based on something. But just to say that because my, our colleague is here, he should lay it on his behalf. For me, we are not satisfied. The minister will not be here to lay this uh, Big loan, another big loan agreement. 
my, my colleague, a uh, very good friend, and uh, he's very amenable to some of these things. The minister was here. You, you, you were a witness. He came to answer a number of questions. I engaged him, and then he asked me to speak with you. In fact, I actually forgot to speak with you that he has some something urgent he has to attend. So he, he's just dashing out of parliament to attend to this. So, and you are the ranking member of the of the of the committee. Eventually, we'll come to you. You are his good friend as well. So, I think we may just have to let this go and just do the laying. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I will ignore the allegation that the road minister is my good friend, but uh, I will uh, uh, allow the colleague to uh, lay the, the, the agreement. Very well. So, we turn to page number four, item number eight, presentation of papers. So, Honorable Minister for Lands and Natural Resources will do that on behalf of the Minister for Rules and Highways. Design and build contract agreements between the government of the Republic of Ghana, represented by the Ministry of Roads and Highways, and Messrs. QGMI, Constructions e Infrastructuras Globalis, QGMI, and Rango Construction Company Limited, RCCL, for an amount of 115,873,217 euros and 87 cents for the design and construction of the Tediase Manfi, Ophredias and Recruits Project. Honorable members, the agreement has been duly presented. It is referred to the Committee on Rules and Transport for consideration and report. Yes, let's move to item number nine, which is presentation and first reading of bills. I will equally invite the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources to do that on behalf of Minister for Trade and Industry. An act to establish the Ghana Standards Authority amend and consolidates the law relating to standardization, conformity, assessment and metrology, and provide for related matters. Honorable members, the bill is read the first, the first time and referred to the Committee on Trade, Industry and Tourism for consideration and report. Yes, we come back to the statements. Why? The two brothers, are you leaving? Just because. It just occurred to me, I looked here, I looked here, and both of you are leaving. No, just because I, I would not leave until you leave, Mr. Speaker. I promise you. I'm not leaving until you leave. The minister might want to go and attend to some government business. And as a member of parliament, I'm with you till till. Thank you. <laughs> so, let me, Honorable Kuviadam, I'll come to you. But let me take another statement before I come to you. So, let me take a statement. Sevramwa is not here again. Very well. So, uh, no, I'll come to him. After this, I'll come to him. Because his is a, is a different... <laughs> Very well. So, Honorable, hold on. Let me listen to Honorable Kofi Adams. A statement on the occasion of the first anniversary of the death of former President of the Republic, His Excellency Jerry John Lawrence by the member for BIM. So, Honorable Member, the floor is yours. 
you may read your statement. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to make this statement marking the first anniversary of the death of former President Jerry John Rawlings. Mr. Speaker, on the 12th November 2020, our nation woke up to hear the sad news that former President Jerry John Rawlings had died at Kolebu Teaching Hospital here in Accra. In line with our best Ghanaian traditions, friends and foes joined together in friendship and solidarity to give him a fitting farewell. As we mark the first anniversary of his death today, it is not only proper that we continue to celebrate him for his immensely significant contributions to bringing our nation to the place where we are today. But above all, it is of the utmost importance that we remind ourselves of the causes of socioeconomic difficulties and resulting political upheavals that led to his rise to power. Mr. Speaker, before President Rawlings began to extend power to the rest of the country in the second half of the 1980s, the national grid had ended in Kumasi and coverage was less than 40% of our population. The rest of the country slept in darkness at night or had to make do with kerosene lanterns or diesel power generators which provided power in the evening from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings refused to accept that the project was not technically feasible. He refused to accept that the electric power will leak away into the atmosphere as it extends beyond Kumasi. He took the bold decision to have power extended to all regional and district capitals, including towns and villages within 20 kilometers of a power line. Today, the national power grid extends to all parts of and more than 85% of Ghanaian households have access to electricity. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we are on course to achieving 100% coverage by 2030. Mr. Speaker, today, any 18-year-old Ghanaian with a sound mind is allowed by our constitution to participate in elections at the local and national levels. Back then, you did not have the right to vote until you were 21. This was part of the package of measures he instituted to free Ghanaian youth to take part in the governance process way back in 1988. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, Many of the things we accept as normal and proper today, such as the concept of decentralization and the concept of meaningful participation in the taking of decisions at the grassroots level, did not come easy as they threatened the established order at the time. But he persisted, and today these principles are institutionalized in the existence of metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies. And of course, we know they breathe through the common fund allocation. I would like to use the Sunyani district as it was in those days to demonstrate what the principles of decentralization and participatory democracy meant for the people of Ghana at that time. Today, due to his policies, that single Sunyani district 
is broken up into Tano North District, Tano South District, the Sunyani Municipal, and the Sunyani West Districts, with their headquarters at Joyong Kwanta, Bichim, Sunyani, and Odumasi, respectively. Mr. Speaker, President Rawlings, therefore, gave thousands of people who were otherwise marginalized or excluded altogether the opportunity to participate in the taking of decisions which affect their lives as well as the development of their local areas. Mr. Speaker, today the Directive Principles of State Policy which is embedded in Chapter 6 of our 1992 National Constitution, provides for political, economic, and sociocultural rights, often spoken about among progressive sections of our people, but not implemented before his time. In the years to come, I believe the provisions of this chapter, which what the states must do for its citizens and what the citizens must do for each other will come to constitute one of the most enduring political legacies of President Jerry John Rawlings. Mr. Speaker, today is taken for granted that when a man dies, the matrimonial house in which the wife and the children resided with him becomes the property of his wife and children. In the past, they were driven out by the man's family. To change this, Mr. Speaker, did not come easy. Today, it is taken for granted that when an accident occurs, the insurance company will pay compensation. This was not so in the past, as the industry was invaded by many shady businessmen who collected premiums and simply pocketed the funds. Starting from the establishment of the JPATE Committee in the mid-1980s and the acceptance of its report and recommendations, President Rawlings set out to establish the robust and growing insurance industry which is in operation today. Mr. Speaker, these and many more rights that we enjoy today were introduced by our late leader in the face of stiff resistance because they threatened the existing establishment at the time. I could go on and on to talk about the sinking of boreholes across the length and breadth of the country and compare how things were then and what they are now and how they impacted the lives of our people. I could similarly talk about schools and colleges and universities. I could do the same for hospitals and clinics and roads and bridges and show how each instance President Rawlings increased output exponentially. I could talk about how he dissolved the border guards and established in his place the Ghana Immigration Service as we know it today. But that would literally take the, all the day. Mr. Speaker, the statistics show that President Jerry John Rawlings came to meet an economy which was performing at negative 6.9 of GDP in 1982. Negative minus 6.9 of GDP in 1982. By the time he was leaving office, he had turned things around. He left for his successors an economy that was consistently performing at an annual growth rate of above 5% of GDP. Such was the level of his success in turning around the country's economic fortunes that even the U.S. President Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Margaret Thatcher of the United Kingdom, who could not be said to be particularly fond of him, were compelled to commend him for his exemplary leadership 
and touted him as an example to the rest of the developing world. Mr. Speaker, indeed, President Jerry John Rawlings was not a conventional politician. Jerry John Rawlings was a strong man, a man with such deep compassion for the ordinary Ghanaian. He was a strong Pan-Africanist. He was a strong Air Force fighter pilot and a symbol of the excellence of the Ghana Armed Forces. He was a strong patriot. Indeed, he was a strong leader. Mr. Speaker, he was a strong believer in the socio-economic development of Ghana and did not hesitate in taking decisions which created controversy in society as long as those decisions were essential for the advancement of Ghana. His fighting spirit and passion for social justice were his driving force towards the creation of the building blocks of a democratic system that allows Ghanaians to participate in the political decision-making of our country today. Today, we are the eighth parliament under the fourth republic because Jerry John Rawlings fought to ensure this as part of his legacy. Mr. Speaker, the words to describe the loss to our nation and to our continent are extremely difficult to encompass in this statement. So I quote the touching words of world leaders to best describe who Jerry Rawlings was and what he stood for. And I share some quotes with you. President, and I quote, President Jerry Rawlings stands out among great men and women the Republic of Ghana has given to the cause of freedom and socio-economic emancipation of the African continent and her people. In that vein, as Namibians, we owe President Rawlings and the people of Ghana an immense debt of gratitude for the moral and material support Ghana provided to the cause of independence and freedom from the illegal occupation of Namibia by the apartheid regime of South Africa. His Excellency H. Jingyo, President of the Republic of Namibia. Dr. Dlamani Zuma, the former chairperson of the African Union Commission said, he surrendered his very being to the fearless service of the people of the continent. Sheila Jackson Lee, U.S. Member of Congress said, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings was truly committed to the Ghanaian people through his years as a military leader and political revolutionary that impacted the entire continent of Africa and the world. His Excellency Michael Hinges, President of the Republic of Ireland said, the important role of former President Rawlings in forging democracy in Ghana will be long remembered. His Excellency Tabo Imbeki, former President of South Africa said, during this time of great need for our continent, his untimely death has robbed Africa of one of its outstanding Pan-African leaders. Mr. Speaker, His Excellency Desiree Botez, former President of the Republic of Suriname said, he was a true champion for the underprivileged and a true African. He was my friend and my guiding light in my political career. His Excellency P.J. Peterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, said, Jerry Rawlings was an active partner in connecting the people of Africa and its descendants in the Caribbean. He was a militant nationalist who fought relentlessly to preserve, promote the African identity. He was a strong Pan-Africanist, and in the Commonwealth, he was a powerful voice for small developing countries. Honorables Babrali and Karim Bas, 
in the proceedings and debates of the 116th Congress Second Session of the United States House of Representatives honored the life and career of Jerry John Rawlings, and I quote an essay. President Rawlings' commitment to justice and opportunity extended beyond Ghana and the African continent to African Americans and the African diaspora. The United States Congress stands in solidarity with the people of Ghana as they commemorate President Rawlings' legacy. Mr. Speaker, to those who believe in the vision of President Jerry Rawlings and thus work with him in various capacities to effect this vision, these phrases resonated in their eulogies, in their eulogies, Mr. Speaker. Compassion for the ordinary person, you will hear it and read it. Fighter for social justice, you will hear it. Source of inspiration for Ghanaians. Giant of Ghanaian politics, the voice for the voiceless, leadership of integrity, unreserved dedication to duty, a people-centered approach to development, and many more, Mr. Speaker. Much of what is written about late leader simply ignores the facts. Simply, Mr. Speaker, ignores the facts. He did not try to take over Ghana in June 1979. He himself was in the cells when the ordinary ranks, disillusioned and angered by the then military government, coupled by the political awakening of the famous May 15th, 1979 mutiny trial, decided to break him out of the cells and release him to lead them. Jerry Rawlings had to ride a tiger past the national drought, past the wild bushfires, and past the expulsion of one million Ghanaians from Nigeria in order to get it under control and to begin to direct the enormous outburst of exuberant energies of the nation's youth towards the construction of the socio-economic and political structure that's still relevant today. Mr. Speaker, in his last address to this august house on 13th January, the year of our Lord 2000, former President Jerry John Rawlings alluded to the painful events in our history and pointed out the sacrifices that individuals and families had painfully paid to bring our nation from the brink of unmitigated disaster to the calm waters of peace and security that we enjoy today. And I quote, we could not have turned the country round nor come this far without taking some difficult, painful, unpalatable, but necessary decisions. In the process, we have offended upset some people and hurt others. To all such persons, I say we are sorry. We set out to make a revolution. Without the revolution, we could not have arrived at the situation we are fortunate to find ourselves in today. With a stable political order and democratic constitution. Rawlings' concern, Mr. Speaker, was that we should not take lightly the progress we have achieved at such a great cost. As we celebrate his one-year anniversary today, we should be reminded of the cost of freedom we enjoy today, so that we neither abuse nor take it for granted. But today is also a day to give thanks to God for gifting President Rawlings to us to steer the ship of our nations safely through what is arguably the most turbulent times in our post-independence history. Above all, it is important that we endeavor to put our divisive politics aside 
and on a day such as this, so that we can better learn the lessons of the past as we go into the future, so that history does not repeat itself. To borrow the words of wisdom from our deceased leader to this house, 21 years ago, we must make a common cause to secure the future of our nation. I pray that God continues to guide each and every one of us in the discharge of our onerous duties. J.J. Rawlings, State of the Nation Address, January 13, 2000. May the spirit of Jerry Rawlings be our guiding light. May his soul rest in perfect peace. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for this opportunity. Well, well. So let me welcome comments. And I will start from my sister member from Saraga. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to this brilliant statement from my honorable colleague, Kofi Adam. And Mr. Speaker, may I say that the soul of the late president, Jerry John Rawlings, the founder of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, rest in perfect peace. Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said about this son of Ghana, that sometimes you wonder whether there is anything at all to add. But history will tell us that it's important that we remind ourselves about the good, the bad, and the ugly, just so that we can imbibe the good, we can try and correct the bad, and we might stay away from the ugly. Former President Rawlings, was a thorough statesman of this country. He was one individual who managed to navigate the field of being a military leader to become the most successful democratically elected president of this country in the Fourth Republic. Mr. Speaker, we had a president who knew the pulse of the country. At every one time, President Rawlings knew what was happening in this country. Mr. Speaker, if you saw him in working gear, cleaning the Nima gutters, you didn't need a speech on national television at 9 p.m. to remind us that we needed to clean our environment. This was the type of leadership that President Rawlings provided for this country. His sense of social justice, seeking and creating opportunities, equal opportunities for every Ghanaian, was what endeared him to Ghanaians. And on 31st December 2016, after the party that he founded, had lost the general election. At the 31st December celebration, he made this statement, and he said, and I quote, I knew human nature, and that is why I was able to be around for 19 years. I knew human nature, and that is why I won every election that I contested, unquote. Mr. Speaker, human nature was so central to the life of the ex-president that for every single policy initiative during his period, it was for the benefit of the people of Ghana. 
If you talk about road infrastructure, if you talk about education, if you talk about the extension of electricity to rural and every corner of this country, President Rawlings talked about the ordinary Ghanaian. Mr. Speaker, if you just oppose President Rawlings' regime to what we've experienced after he left office, you wonder whether this is what he spent all his life fighting for. President Rawlings has not spent his life fighting for a retrogressive Ghana. He brought us light. We saw it. He brought us water. We drank it. He brought us roads. We traveled on it. Yes. Mr. Speaker, before the President Rawlings built the Kumasi Tamale Highway. It used to take us three weeks to travel from Tamale to Kumasi. And we used to travel on vehicles called Bone Shaker, Wat on Chine. And you'll be in the Wat on Chine and just be praying that you get there after three weeks. Today, we can go to Tamale in a day, in less than 24 hours. And especially for those of us from that part of the country, we owe it all to this giant of a statesman. Mr. Speaker, discipline has been bemoaned in this country. The sense of discipline, President Rawlings imbibed that in us. Mr. Speaker, at that time, that President Rawlings was president of this country, maybe many of us need to share the same space with him. But at least we have stories about how 8 o'clock meeting time was 8 o'clock meeting time. 9 o'clock meeting time was 9 o'clock meeting time. And it was due to the discipline of the man who was in charge of the system. We often say, that the best way to lead is by action. And so if he called the meeting and got there at 8, you have no reason not to be there at 8. And this is what he left for us. Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that as we celebrate the first anniversary of the, his demise, we will go back as a nation to some of these values and bring our country back to join the Committee of Nations in a more positive narrative than what we presently have. Mr. Speaker, the maker of the statement enumerated several challenges that face the tenure of President Rawlings as leader of this country. He mentioned the bushfires, he mentioned the drought, he mentioned the famine. Maybe on the scale of aggregating all these disasters, we could say that we had disasters bigger than COVID. But Ghanaians sailed through it because leadership showed leadership. Leadership demonstrated leadership. Leadership stood with the people. Leadership did, did not discriminate and leadership did not stand apart from us. So Ghanaians came together and traveled these difficult situations. We are hoping, even as we begin to see the tail end of COVID, which I pray happens one day, that we will show the same commitment to the development of our country and support our leaders to eradicate COVID from Ghana once and for all. Mr. Speaker, with these few words, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity and to once again congratulate the maker of the statement and to say for the last time, may the soul of President Rawlings find eternal rest. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Let me come to uh, veteran honorable member for Buyakwa South.
Honorable, Cape Cruz, I'll come to you, please. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to add my voice to what might even be called an eulogy of one of the greatest men that we've had. I call him one of the greatest we had because he even enjoyed longevity more than Osadu for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And the, the history of the young flight lieutenant and the kinds of risk he took and the courage of his conviction that even when it was a coup d'etat and they have to deal with it, he said, well, let's leave everybody and I take the blame. In fact, he was a colossus of a politician. But he graduated also from what people might want to call social engineering through violence and then social engineering through democratic consensus. So at the end of the day, what marks him out as one of the greatest men we've had as to how he transitioned from revolutionary days, I beg to say that there was nothing like a parliament. And uh, I wonder whether we will have a budget uh, uh, um, uh, uh, reading and then the members of parliament will begin to interrogate it. But for me, it is very important to place on record that he did this country a lot of good by coming back to what we are witnessing now, the Fourth Republic. And now we have our democracy and we are continuing. But now, Speaker, I had a personal engagement with President Rollins and I want to talk about that shortly and then resume my seat. I do not know what happened one day the wife of this great man called me that she wanted to come and see me. And I said, you've been the first lady of this land. I'd rather have to come and see you. So please, if you can tell me where you are, I'll come over and see you. So I went to see the first lady, Anna Kunedu Ajima Rollins. And he said, well, my husband wants to hire you as his lawyer. For me, it was uh, counterintuitive. A condemned Buzia Dankwa Dumbo man with all the army of NDC lawyers. President Rollins wanted to hire me as his lawyer. It was a very serious thing. So eventually, I was ushered into his presence. And I can tell you that even when he was not the head of state, you can never take from him the aura of authority and elegance. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he went into a conclave. I consulted a few people, and I became his lawyer. As a matter of fact, what was very interesting was that his own confidant has written a book, Professor Andanso Boafo, that he felt he didn't approve the entire content of the book. So there was necessity to place an injunction on the launching of the book for them to sit down so he would delete what he didn't like. And guess what? President Rollins has always been authoritative in his views about this matter. So, right now, Speaker, in the face of uh, freedom of thought and expression, how could I go to a court of competent jurisdiction to stop the expression of thought? It was a very difficult work to do. But then we came to the conclusion that President Rawlings was the working national security. If he wanted to understand national security, it was national security personified. So if anybody wanted to deal with him, and published things that he felt 
we're not good. We could just assume it and the national security and it will be all right. As a matter of fact, we place the whole case at the national security that what the man is about to publish will undermine national security. Eventually, we succeeded in brokering peace between the two of them and the uh, publication never saw the light of day. All right, Mr. Speaker, what touched uh, uh, my heart is when he asked me what are my legal fees? And I told him that how can I exact money from somebody who has served this great nation? Rather than speaker, I was shocked one day I'm about to do my primaries and somebody was knocking at my door. I said, who is this man? He said, he's an emissary from uh, Pre uh, President Rollins. So really, what is it about? He said, the great man is telling you that you are going to win the primaries. And he hasn't gotten so much money for you. But here is a token, a symbol of his power that you've won already. Right now, Mr. Speaker, it's not how hefty the money was, but my biggest surprise and a spiritual blessing. As a matter of fact, I won Lance light. And I came back to appreciate him. One day, he told me that somebody was hurting at the knees. That was the, the other side that people didn't know. He had huge humanity. In, in spite of the uh, exterior of uh, uh, um, military might and the rest of it, this man had so much of humanity. I said, somebody has to undergo a knee operation. And whether I could be of some help in trying to pay you for the knee operation. I assisted in that endeavor, but what touched me was how even in the evening of his years, there are so many people who was attending to and was interested in the well-being of a fellow um, human beings. I agree with the statement which is on the floor that he had common humanity. We've lost a very, 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 very important personality in our political history. But he was blessed by God. He crossed the 70 years. Some people didn't have it that way. And we give God the praise for giving us this man. A man who was an, a mixture of so many things. And as my sister said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But whatever it is, he served Ghana well. And uh, may he so rest in peace. At this, on this occasion, my heart also goes out to um, uh, the beautiful uh, medical doctor who is now a politician, who I might say is treading in the father's shoes, and also the, the first lady, the longest first lady of the realm, and the rest of the children. And I know that the example of this man will all help everybody to see what it is to serve a nation. If I'm permitted, may I say, may he so rest in peace. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Yes, another member for Cape Coast South. Is it Cape Coast South? South, yes. Very well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to statement made by my Honourable Brother, Honourable Kofi Adams. He has so eloquently and so detailed talked about our late president, President Rawlings. President Rawlings was a larger than life figure. His impact will long be felt. He's somebody who put Ghana first, a leader who put Ghana first. If we are to learn anything from him, or to remember him, we should remember that we should all put Ghana first. And that there is a lot that binds us together than what actually divides us. And that if we unite and put Ghana first, there is a lot that we can achieve as a, as a country. He was good at picking talent. He assembled some of the best brains 
during his time in his government. He did not discriminate. If you have anything to offer, he will bring you on board. You just have to impress him that you have something that you can offer your country. And a lot of things were done by many great people who were doing their own things. He was able to bring them together and bring all those brains together to help us to where we actually are today. He is arguably the architect of the First Republic. The democracy that we enjoy today, the Fourth Republic, the democracy that we enjoy today could be attributed to the work that he started basically doing. As my honorable brother said, he was a man of authority, no doubt about it. A great leader and a very charismatic one. You can't take that away from him. But he was a great disciplinarian. He believed that if we could develop as a country, we should have some level of discipline in our society. And again, if we're going to remember him, then we'll remember him by being disciplined, doing the right things, driving on the right side of the road and obeying um, the, the road regulations. As you know, in, on one occasion, he had to get out, out of his car to direct traffic. That is the kind of man that President Rollins was. You couldn't mention President Rollins' name without mentioning the words probity, accountability, and transparency, social justice. These are the things that he stood for. He stood for social justice, stood for fairness and equality. Honorable Kofi Adams rightly said, President Rollins was not your conventional politician. He wasn't actually a conventional man. He believed in what he believed in, and he executed it to the best, to the best of his ability. I'm sure he had some regrets, as, as, as we all do or will eventually do, but he did the best with the best of the um, ability that was given to him. We've lost a great man. He had a great sense of humor, those who got the opportunity to get to know him closely that he could crack some of the serious jokes you have ever heard. At one time, I was having a conversation with him, and uh, I was talking about uh, a coup d'etat. Then he looked at me and said, are you trying to tell me I'm a serial coup maker? And uh, I said, no, sir, I'm just trying to tell you that you have experience, you know, in that. He said, have you also forgotten that I could become anything? I said, yes, of course. You were a soldier, you became a Democrat. So President Rollins could actually, could have become anything. He, he knew how to adapt. His timing was very good. The time to come, the time to go. Even the time he disappeared finally was unexpected. We have lost a great leader. And I hope that those of us who have the opportunity in the whole country, the things we learn from him, we will actually implement them and make the lives of every Ghanaian better. Mr. Speaker, with these few words, I thank you. Let them come to leadership. Please, let's be snappy. Yeah. Right, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity and I thank my good friend for this statement. Mr. Speaker, I know many years to come, there may be others who may say many good things about our former president, uh, and I think that would be rightly so. Mr. Speaker, love him or hate him, you would admire something about President Rawlings. Indeed, he is not a perfect man, neither am I or my father, but he is convinced of his ways. The story of uh, Honorable Atachia should let us understand what my good friend is saying. That if he finds something good in you, your location, your religion, your, your background doesn't matter to him. He will draw upon your, your, your wisdom. Indeed, um, people qu queried, in our fraternity we queried, couldn't you find any other lawyer apart from uh, 
uh, Honorable Atach Atachi had those days. But he was convinced that was the person he wanted to be his uh, lawyer. Mr. Speaker, I encountered President Rawlings when I was a student in London in the days when um, there was controversy as to whether his, uh, uh, what do you call it, right or something had been withdrawn. Uh, so Ghana High Commission would no longer pick him. Interestingly, some few of us, uh, through another channel, who could, who, he could even drop on us, we'll get a vehicle to pick him and uh, uh, the First Lady from the airport to wherever they want to be. Uh, we were surprised, we were nobodies, our parents were nobodies, but he could rely on us to be able to do those things at, at those uh, stages. Mr. Speaker, today, when you have electricity in Adaklu, you will take it for granted. In fact, I used to tell people in Adaklu that, do you realize that the project is called Self-Help Electrification Project? Because those days, these days we pass this agreement in this house, those days when they pass it, the community need to get the poles planted. So communities have to buy iron rod cement and mold their concrete poles, plant them, the electricity company will come and string the, the cables for you. Today, nobody does that. The electricity company or Ministry of Energy does that. So if you have electricity in the hinterland, in Ghana today, that process started from President uh, Rawlings. Today, it is easy for anybody to take milk, to take sugar or even buy clothes. Mr. Speaker, there were times when a tin of milk was one of the most luxurious things you can ever find because it wasn't available. Because in the words of economists, our economy was completely uh, shattered. Education. Schools were not that much in the country. President Rollins' determination is that ordinary people like me should also have education. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I don't come from any, any privileged background. But the fact that my father joined the group that were holding cocoa from the hinterland and others, I got the opportunity to go to school. That is why I'm here. His humanity is such that it is not only those people whose parents have big names, have served in government before, should have the opportunity to become whatever they want to become. And his own background is an example of how God-given talent can be allowed to flourish if you allow that to be. Mr. Speaker, I believe there will be more time to talk about President Rawlings, and I have no doubt that maybe by now we should be instituting some academic desks in some of the universities, perhaps maybe in uh, UDS, which is one of the uh, public universities uh, actually help uh, establish to have an academic desk where we can actually begin to study what makes this man different from many of us. I am sure that would be very helpful. So I want to also join those people to uh, congratulate the maker of the statement and also pray that the loss to our sister, our colleague, and the mother and the brother and sisters uh, should just rest assured that their father, their husband lived a, a life worthy and that, yes, he regrets some of the excesses of uh, uh, June 4th, 1979, and 31 December 1981. But the sum total of a man's life is not necessarily only about what he's done wrong, but the summary of all the things he's done. And if we make this uh, uh, calculation, without a doubt, Mr. Speaker, President Rollins has been a blessing to this country, and he's so rest in peace. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes. Um, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, and to thank the maker of the statement, coming from no other person than Honorable Kofi Adams, who has actually lived many of his adult life with the former president, uh, Jerry Dan Rawlis. Uh, this morning I was behind him and Honorable Confordoyo at the church service for his one year, um, his uh, death. Um, Mr. Speaker, there's no denying the fact that um, His Excellency President Jerry John Rawlings uh, is a statesman, he is a national hero, he is a man who has actually come one way or the other to contribute his quota to the development of Mother Ghana, having come through a military junta in 1979. And when the 
cleanup exercise, as it was so called, was done, power or election was held. He, however, uh, surprisingly came back in 1981 to be able to take back the mantle of power, to be able to fight corruption and account for accountability in the country. And having successfully done that, then Ghana was able to come to the Fourth Republic in 1992. He contested the election. He won. He contested again in 1996. And then in 2001, he handed over power to President John Ajekum Kufo. Mr. Speaker, that was the interesting part. At the time that he was handing over power, many were of the view that it was not going to happen. Because as his colleagues in various countries who also came through the gun were not ready to let power go. And if they were able to even leave or be able to transform to a democratic governance, they still find it very difficult letting power go. But this man, in the person of Jerry John Rawlings, was able to swallow his pride, was able to uh, prove people wrong, and then handed over power to President before. Even that, there was a lot of uh, thinking and security commentators commenting that what happened in 1981 could happen in 2001. He lived peacefully in Ghana. He was the outspoken type. He was charismatic during his tenure as president of this great nation, especially in the northern region. If you go to northern region now, there are still mothers who still belong to the NDC. But when you ask them, they still say that it is Jerry John Rawlings NDC. They don't know that the Jerry John Rawlings NDC then is not the Jerry John Rawlings NDC now. Uh, as he founded the party, he was actually, you know, helping Professor Mills to make sure that he be able to live up to expectation what he stood for. But at the later part, as the founder of this party, he died a very sad man, not being happy with the NDC. And um, at the time that he left this world, he has spoken. I don't know why my colleague is up. It is on public record. He said it on BBC. He said it on other platforms. So, in Honorable leader, don't, 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 okay, don't, Mr. Mr. don't Mr. jump Speaker, into I'm the guided. controversial. I'm guided. Just, to be con just to conclude, Mr. Speaker, to conclude, Jerry, President Jerry John Rawlings, may his soul rest in perfect peace. He has a very hardworking daughter who is uh, a member of us here. He has founded the party today that uh, we are all having um, the other side of the device was uh, representing that party through his own thinking and his own doing and the effort that he has put for the NDC to stand on his feet. With these few words, Mr. Speaker, I thank the maker of the statement and I wish our former president well wherever he is, even though he died as an unhappy man with the NDC. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. On our honorable leader, we still have some statement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, at the moment, looking at the time, uh, if we can defer that statement to another day, and time has already been far spent. It is almost five to four. So we are in your hands for adjournment, Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are in your hands. But before I sit down, I want to tell my brother that Rollins NDC is the same yesterday, the same today, and it will be the same tomorrow. And he died a happy man as NDC founder. So they should take a cue so that whoever will die from the party should die as a happy man in their party. Thank you. But honorable comfort, if you have something to say, you should have. <laughs> anyway. Mr. Speaker, I have delivered my message already, so we are in your hands. Very Thank well. You. Honorable member for Manson Quanta, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I would have wished that your statement is read, but unfortunately, you can see 
Yes. So, honorable members, the time is fast spent, and therefore I'll go ahead to adjourn the House to Tuesday, the 16th of November 2021, at 10 o'clock in the forenoon. But meanwhile, you are all invited to Kumasi to take part in the speaker's breakfast meeting. The House stands adjourned.